am grateful to all of committee members, the lecturers at the Department of History, who work hard to prepare this conference. I thank the building management of the Gedung Sarial Tower. I am grateful to give us permission to make use this lecture the Department of History conference and dialogue to prepare this conference. Hopefully, today's conference and dialogue tomorrow run well and we can take benefits from this. Welcome and happy conference and dialogue. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarkawi. So next we invite uh, Muhammad Miftaf Jisurur, uh, Dr. M. Kis SPPAD, KGEH, PhD, and to uh, make some remarks and we'll open the conference program. Please. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Dean and also all the professor and uh, all the research scientists. Ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you all to Universitas Erlangga. I know that you are joining this conference and dialogue from different time zones. So good afternoon and good morning, respectively. Some of you are attending online and some others are attending on site in several rooms on the fourth floor of our new building, the Airlangga Saria and Entrepreneurship Education Center, building in Campus B, Universitas Airlangga. This building is new building with a distinctive architecture and I'm glad to welcome you in our proudly new building. Universitas Erlangga considers the conference and dialogue on Japanese occupations and Indonesian's revolutions brings interesting issue. After all, wars will leave memories, but good and bad. As far as I know, the Indonesian leaders have big hearts. They never recall painful even during the wars. In contrast, several nations are still bringing up bad memories of the past that are not only rose nationalism and learn from past bitterness, but they also rose haters. So thanks to the generosity of our leaders, the feelings of resentment and hatred of Indonesian toward nations who colonized Indonesia, in this case, the Netherlands and Japan, have never been crystallized. This activity is very appropriate to undertake at Universitas Erlangga because it is located in Surabaya, which is well known as the Kota Pahlawan city of Perus. And during the Indonesian revolutions, the people of Surabaya, it, its surroundings are as hero, heroically and massively for the survived Indonesian independence. And the peak of the struggle that is known as the Battle of Surabaya that occurred on November 10, 1945. To commemorate this event on November 10, 1952, President Sukarno inaugurated the establishment of an obelisk in the center of Surabaya Tuku Pahlawan, the obelisk of heroes. The heroes' attitudes in Battle Surabaya have been formed since the Dutch colonial period, and it was in Surabaya where many Indonesian national figures developed their ideas of Indonesian nationalism and independence. Several figures, including Sukarno, received their political educations in Surabaya. The Surabaya has long history in the nationalist movement and struggle from the, the Indonesian independence. Likewise, Indonesian Universitas Erlangga, the forerunner of Universitas Erlangga, the NIAS Netherlands in this arts and school, also oh, become the focus of independent oh, ideas of yeah. Indonesian nationalism and independence. One of the national figures in the Indonesian nationalist movement, Dr. Sutomo, after completing his medical specialist at the University of Amsterdam, 
in the first half of 1920 he returned to indonesia and he became a lecturer of the at the nias and involved in nationalist movement in surabaya in addition one of the former rectors the late professor dr hat sudarso jonegoro become one of the pejuang kemerdekaan we call mm-hmm. as freedom fighter during the indonesian war of the independence to give you on informative affirmative information Untas Erlangga was officially founded on 10 November 1955. The date was intent the remind of the spirit of defending the Indonesian independence of Surabaya in 1945. Hopefully, the conference and dialogue will result a thoughtful ideas and a chichit in remembering wars in the name of the God. I open. This conference and dialogue. Thank you. Good luck with the conference and dialogue. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Bapak Muhammad Miftahul Suruz, PhD, and uh, open in this conference. So uh, we come. So we come to program of conference. We will guide by Dias Prada Dimara, M.E. Uh, but yes, Brother Dimara, please, uh, you can conduct it uh, in this conference. And thank you, everybody. Enjoy for the conference. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, waalaikum salam. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my voice can be heard, uh, can be heard uh, properly, or there's some problem. Okay. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my uh, honor to be uh, invited to this uh, conference as uh, the moderator. This is a very important um, event, uh, and I'm more than uh, honored to be uh, serving as this uh, as the moderator for this. But before we go to the uh, uh, program, I would like to talk about some logistics. Um, Let me share uh, the logistics. Okay. 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 Uh, I hope I can. We can see the uh, presentation. Can you see that already? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is the uh, logistic for today. Um, we will have six hours for this uh, uh, discussion where there will be three keynote speakers and then uh, seven presenters, um, which means that uh, we will have 10 speakers in, where, in which uh, each speaker will have only 15 minutes. That's already uh, uh, quite tight. So I would like to uh, ask your patience for this uh, very uh, limited time. Secondly, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are Um, we are doing this uh, online in which we are expecting more participants from three different uh, time zones, or in fact, five different time zones, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Japan, and three th- different time zones in Indonesia. Luckily, um, time zones in Eastern Indonesia is uh, coincide with the time zone in Japan, which means that we cannot start this uh, event earlier because um, it, uh, we will we need uh, uh, the we, we need our uh, dutch friends to be uh, in the morning and then we can we cannot delay the finish of this uh, 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 conference because the, uh, our colleague in, in in eastern indonesia in in japan will be uh, in a very late uh, time so basically what i'm saying is we really have Uh, very limited time and that's why um, after this uh, conference I don't think uh, both the speakers and participants will be happy with me because I need to make sure that uh, both the speakers and the participants can stick to the time otherwise we will not be able to finish all the presentation and uh, question and answers so if I may um, If, uh, I may. Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, both the speakers, but later on also the participants, if they want to ask questions, 
to limit their uh, uh, questions. Uh, so we will have more time for other uh, questioners. So this is the logistic that uh, unfortunately we have to uh, face. As I mentioned, there will be uh, three keynote speakers and then followed by a, a short question and answers, only 15 minutes. And then there will be the first two speakers. And then it followed by a short break, a 10 minutes break. And then the second panel will be three speakers uh, before uh, a 45, min 45 minutes long break, because this is the time when uh, we will give opportunity for those who are in the Indonesian time zone to do their, their, their break and their uh, pray. And then we will follow that up with uh, two more uh, presenters before uh, I will wrap uh, the, the day and give the floor to Jana Karos of the Stichting. So hopefully uh, this is the, the, the situation that we are in and I hope we all, we all can cooperate to maneuver so ensuring that we will have a productive, if rather um, tight uh, discussion. And for the program, I think um, historians, I would say that historians have soft spots for revolutions. I think um, in the 18th century, Alexis Tocqueville and also Edmund Burke and others great historians already pay attention to revolution. Revolution really captures uh, attention, imagination, and uh, debates um, uh, among historians and, and others. Uh, as, as also Indonesian revolution. Um, in Indonesia in 1970s, Nasution, General Nasution, who's also a participant in the Indonesian revolution, has already published his voluminous book on Indonesian revolution. And then the Indonesian government sponsoring uh, various uh, books and, uh, and, and monograph on revolution in various parts of Indonesia in the 70s. So it, again, Indonesian revolution is pretty much part of the Indonesian uh, um, collective memory and part of the uh, Indonesian identity. I think we will hear more about this later on. But also in the international scene, um, Indonesian revolution has captured attention. George Kehin, the American scholars, only several years after the end of the Jaman Revolusi already published his seminal books, Nationalism and Revolusi in Indonesia. That's a translation from the English one. And then for a long time, that has been really an important book on the, on the, on the Revolusi until his students, uh, Ben Anderson wrote Revolusi Pamuda to respond, to expand, to criticize some of his position. And then later on, another scholar from Australia, Anton Lucas, wrote a, a different take on revolution and then follow with Bill, and Bill Frederick and others. Um, so debates and discussion on Indonesian revolution is not new. It has been going on in the 80s. Uh, uh, Audrey Kahin published a collection of books on uh, discussion on different uh, revolution in different areas. And then in Utrecht in 1986, also there is a discussion on, on the same uh, uh, issue. And then recently, there is also uh, more work on the uh, Indonesian revolution. And I'm just putting up four out of 12 uh, titles in which uh, Indonesian revolution has been discussed and, and uh, debated. Uh, and today, we will have uh, another opportunity to think about that. We will go not only on the Indonesian revolution, but also beyond that uh, and previous, that, meaning the Japanese occupation era 1942 to 1945. So uh, I would like to point that the, the goal of this program is to increase universal access to more nuanced information and oral history with a view to achieve mutual understanding and recognition of a shared history in Southeast Asia. And then secondly, uh, to sustain stories and experiences of eyewitnesses in this period and their descendants. And then Lastly, to contribute to the process of reconciliation with the past. And this is our, these three important goals in which we are conducting today's uh, uh, conference and tomorrow's uh, dialogue. If I may, we can summarize uh, those goals into three words, the three keywords in which we hope we will return again and again. One is the notion of shared history. 1942 to 1950 is an important period in which various people shared uh, their past in that moment. 
although from different position, but it's a shared one. And secondly, uh, we need to uh, ensure the voices and stories of forgotten groups, of all groups, in fact, to be uh, preserved, to be heard. Uh, for because uh, as uh, a histor another historian said, because they lived through that period. And then I guess the, the last point from that goal is that this is hopefully will be a, uh, an, a beyond an academic enterprises. It's not only an academic enterprises. That's why we're having dialogue uh, tomorrow. So with that in mind, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for uh, today. Um, and the first one will be Professor Bambang Purwanto. He is a professor at Gajah Mada University, uh, arguably one of the most important historian in Indonesia at the moment. He opened doors for many younger uh, historians. Uh, he facilitated younger historians to explore different uh, uh, subject, a different way of writing. And he also uh, participating in the recently completed four year project on the Indonesian decolonization and revolution. So I think he's the, the right person to give us the keynote speech for the, for the first session. For that uh, uh, purpose, I would like to uh, ask Professor Brambang Purwanto to present his paper. Unfortunately, sir, it's only 15 minutes. Please, sir, thank you. Prof. Bambang Purwanto is here already. Okay. Sorry, always we have always have a, a technical problem here. Thanks very much, much, uh, uh, much, uh, Diaz, uh, um, uh, Good, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everybody there. Um, it, it's really nice to meet you, most of you uh, uh, again. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce myself to those who I never met before. Uh, my, I would like to share my presentation here. Um, it, it's really an honor to be to be in this uh, 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 conference. You know, uh, um, I you can see that I, I somebody may be blamed to me because it, it already uh, uh, planned uh, many years ago uh, for for all of this, uh, but never realized. And then I would like to. Thanks, uh, our friends from uh, UNER to uh, organize it. Uh, the title of my 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 talk is I hope it, I can I can do it in fifteen minutes. The legacy of Japanese and Indonesian historiography. Um, I I I I start uh, with a first quotation. This is I, I took it from Abel Apian in uh, one of his his uh, uh, writing. The, the proclamation of independence, which gave birth to the Indonesian state, was an entirely Indonesian affair. The Japanese occupation government, apart from some individual sympathizers, was an aloof outsider. From the very outside, it was not the official intention to grant the Indonesian political freedom. So this is really a personal, uh, you know, a view of, of uh, uh, late uh, Professor Abila Pian, uh, you, you know him. Uh, I think everybody, most of us know him very well. And his, the second quotation is, but the period of occupation was not without reward. It put an, an end to the Dutch rule in the first place. It provided an opportunity for the people to foster feelings of solidarity in times of hardship nourish the national identity and gather self-confidence to determine the urban future. So now we, we have like a mixed feeling here about the, 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 the Japanese on that period. Okay, I start with this one, the exclusion, what I call it. The existence of Japanese in Indonesian historiography is limited to the period of 1942-1945. It denies the reality around the Japanese in the 17th century Indonesian archipelago when the Dutch started to build their economics and political foundation, such as Japanese missionaries among the OC soldiers who occupied the Maluku Islands, 
leads by J.P. Kuhn, and there were uh, hundreds of eight Japanese out of uh, uh, 8,058 uh, people living in Batavia in 1632. You know, this is a very, very early of the period. So the national narrative, what is the national narrative? The, the historiography also denies the important role of Japanese and economic expansion of the colonial Indonesia. You know, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Western, uh, it, it's more important. In the Japanese contribution to the image of Indonesian capitalists in the few decades before the end of the Dutch authority in the Indonesian archipelago. So there is uh, uh, also another, another problem, another exclusion here. So the narrative is Japanese three and a half years colonization. Colonialization is worse than three and a half centuries of Dutch colonialization. So that's the national narrative of Indonesia. So the problem now, we always uh, come to this problem, colonized or occupied. Japanese occupation Pendudukan Jepang is the general term used by most historians to describe the period between 1942-1945 in Indonesia. Dutch historiography never used the term of Javanese colonialization, but only Javanese occupation instead, exactly the same. Meanwhile, the Indonesian national memory, this is about national memory about the, that period is Javanese colonialization, penjajahan Jepang. So now we we wrote a, a history a occupation, but then we memorize it as uh, our memories about the colonialization. So the two terms in fact have different meanings and consequences of the historiography. Let's see, the hegemony. From the occupation perspective, the Indonesian archipelago is still considered as Dutch colony, which was occupied by the Japanese not an entity of new independent nation in Indonesia. This perspective denied the end of the Dutch colonialization in 1942 and the existence of the, of the 17 August 1945 at the time of Indonesian independence. So that's the, the, the problem now. So mixed feeling again. The early school history textbook written by Indonesian after 1945 used the term of Japanese colonialization, so penjajahan Belanda. Despite Japanese colonialism is still the national historical narrative, the term of Japanese occupation is widely then used also both officially and academically by Indonesia. So, so then, you know, most of Indonesia then is use the same term used by the Dutch and also most of the, uh, 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 you know, uh, foreign uh, uh, scholars. So Dutch perspective, let's see. The returning of Dutch interest after the war considered illegal since the archipelago was still Dutch colony. Declaration of Indonesian independence was given by the Japanese. It is improper way of decolonization. So uh, you can see then when you know uh, most of the, the people consider in, 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 in the Netherlands that Indonesian independence is 27 December 1949. That's because of the, uh, the way that how uh, important a Dutch uh, uh, for the Indonesian independence. The Japanese destroyed the harmony of the society and brought in, in, in anger and violence instead. So that, that's, that's a very strong feeling, you know. Uh, uh, you, you can see uh, uh, but some report at the early of, from 1946, 1947, you, you can read this kind of, of, of uh, 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 narrative. So Japanese period of 1942, to 1940 is an evil. It should be blamed for the destruction of the colony and suffering experienced it during the war and after declaration of Indonesian independence. The Indonesian nationalist elite were war collaborators who worked for Japanese and exploited their own people. You see this one? This is one of very one of very famous in in the uh, uh, at the. Uh, you know, in the in the 
uh, one of the part of, of this uh, uh, picture you can see insinyur sukarno bagaimana rasa di hati tuan melihat buah pekerjaan tuan ini so sukarno was blamed yeah to be a, a collaborator so this is reality in fact but also propaganda so indonesian perspective the Netherlands in this government ended in March 1942. So the end of Dutch colonialism. Japan replaced Dutch being new colonial power in Indonesian archipelago. Indonesian as a nation declared its open independent in, in 17 August 1945 and found Republic of Indonesia as the repre, replacement of colonial state. So the birth of Indonesian uh, um, state. So the returning of Dutch interests assisted by the British is an attempt to recolonizing the Indonesian archipelago. There is no decolonization process. That's Indonesian perspective. What happened between 1945-1949 was war defending, defending independence, not war for independence. This is a very different, you know, the war defending independence, not war for independence. So the legacy, the Japanese period 1942-1945 is a very important in creating independence in Indonesia. Indonesian crystallized its nationalism when experiencing with the complexity of Japanese colonialization. The foundation of Indonesian state was prepared when, when Japanese still in power, not during the Dutch colonial time. So now I will end the, my presentation, what I could call it as uh, the constructing historiography. A new approach is required to restructure the position of Japanese in Indonesian historiography. It is not only a matter of period 1942-1940. Why? A long-term impact of Japanese in Indonesian archipelago could be considered as an alternative approach in understanding our interrelation between Japan and Indonesia in the process of history without denying the existence of Western influence and Dutch colonialization. I think that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, it will uh, give something uh, for the discussion. Thanks, Mas. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Prof. Bambang. Um, it's you still have five minutes. If you like to add some more, or you would no, like no, to... no, no, okay. no, no. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, uh, Bambang, Prof. Bambang, never shy away to provoke different way of looking at history, and as demonstrated today. His question, he questioned the way we write histories, the different ways we like history, and how we like how we should think of positioning the Japanese, Japanese actors and Japanese period in Indonesian history and Indonesian historiography. And I hope we will have uh, more time later on to discuss more about this uh, point. Uh, and the next presenter will be Professor uh, Friedu Stalen. Um, he is a uh, an expert on uh, Molucas history, on uh, the history of the Molucas in, in the Netherlands. But uh, from the several times I've met him in the past, uh, he's always coming up with a different way of, of, of looking at history. Uh, at one point, he was uh, making audio video uh, recording of, um, of uh, ordinary life uh, in Sulawesi. And, and he also uh, spent many years working on oral history. So it would be a great opportunity for us to uh, listen to his talk, especially when we're dealing with trying to listen to different voices and different stories uh, from the past. Uh, please, uh, Professor uh, Stalen, the floor is yours. Thank you, pa uh, pa Diaz. Uh, yeah, I, I want to go to a little bit more into into the, the issues of dialogue and the later, <coughs> uh, but let me let me start my contribution by telling you that I'm really very honored uh, to be asked to to give say some words at the opening session in this international dialogue uh, conference. The honor is twofold. First, because it's the first dialogue conference hosted from Indonesia, which I think it's a, it's a milestone. And secondly, because um, 
Professor Aiko Kurosawa and Professor Bambang Purwant who are in the same session. And I learned to know both of them in the first years of this century. Professor Aiko participated in an expert meeting that we organized in 2001 as a closing event for a very successful oral history project called the uh, SMGI, Stichting Modeling Geschiedenis Indonesia, the foundation of the oral history of Indonesia. And, on the end, and this was on the end of Dutch colonial presence in Indonesia. I was a coordinator of that large scale, scale oral history project in which we interviewed 724 people about their lives in the Netherlands East Indies, Indonesia. And Professor Bambang, I met in January 2003 at the conference in Yogyakarta on decentralization, globalization, and uh, local democracy. And since then, we met regularly and worked together in different projects. And I frequently re rely on his advice uh, regularly when discussing the relevance and urgency of history, I refer to a remark by Bambang made once when we discussed a project on the recording daily life in Indonesia, the project that Diaz just mentioned. At that time, Bambang said that it was also important for uh, historians because we have to understand history starting from today. Why is this remark of Bambang important for the dialogue for this dialogue conference? And I think. It's important because this dialogue takes place today. We take, it takes place in our contemporary time. And only by having a dialogue about the past, we also try to understand our today history and our today uh, relations. History is not really something from the past. It's there, it's here, it's alive, and we all carry it with us. So one of the fields that uh, I met Babamang as well as uh, Professor Aiko uh, was in the field of oral history. I'm not an historian, I'm an anthropologist, but maybe because as an anthropologist, I had a lot of experience with interviewing and because some of my work also dealt with history, I was appointed the coordinator of this already mentioned SMGI, this foundation of the oral history. In this project, we work with interviewers and in advisors of different backgrounds. There were anthropologists like me, sociologists, historians, but also adult, adult educators. Exchanging experiences, and reflecting on each other interviews led to a broad and rich approach of interviewing with elements of all disciplines and interests of the individual interviewers and advisors. For example, an interviewer who was more focused on military history learned how to also include questions related to culture or psychology. And what I learned from this project is how important the broad approach of interviewing is to be able to come close to the life story of people. It does justice to the personal differences of people that we interview. If I translate it to the dialogue conference, I would say that we, what we learned in the SMGE project is really to listen, to really listen to what people have to say and what people think is important for them. In the project, we did, discuss, we did not discuss with the interview. We thought that if something was wrong or that's not what it was told like it not was. We raised new questions to find out what the interview really meant or why he or she told the story like it was told. I think this is an important starting point for listening and asking questions to deepen the understanding and find more details of somebody's story. A key principle in the dialogue is careful listening and safe space. In the last two years, I have, <clears throat> together with some Moluccan friends, started to organize what we call Moluccan Dialogues. And with these dialogues, we want to bring issues to the fore that are sensitive, but need to be discussed. One of the starting points in the Moluccan dialogues is that we have to create safe space for the participants. And then our group Moluccans from, there are Moluccans from different generations. <clears throat> and when young members of the uh, third generation, they are convinced, they are most convinced of the need for a safe space. And one reason why they stress the need for safe space is because they, it's the only way they feel free to participate in a dialogue with the second generation. They, the younger generation, had to have has <coughs> the same obstacles to some extent, talking with older generations as the second generation felt when they talked with the first generation. Another point that the members of the third generation consistently tell us is that we should not, that we should use the word dialogue when we talk about our event. We should not use debate or discussion. And it is not a semantic thing. Uh, for them, a dialogue means that we have to listen with respect to each other. And I'm not sure, but I can imagine that the way conversations are conducted via social media makes my younger friends more conscious about the tone of conversation. Many conversations on social media are hard and polarizing. 
And that's not what they want. And it works. We had a dialogue on diversity within the Molokka community. And there to share and to refer to some assumptions that they have towards each other. And this was due to the safe space that we created and the respectful way the dialogue was organized. Even while the dialogue was streamed, because we could not welcome a larger audience because of the COVID regulations. People watching the streaming at home complimented the participants for this respectful way of dealing with each other. A second Moluccan dialogue on the question of what the recent attention for the Dutch violence in Indonesia between 1945 and 1949 meant, means for the Moluccans in the Netherlands was again a respectful dialogue. Of course, there was emotions, but they helped to understand the view of the participants better. The dialogues where I have been talking about until now are conversations in which we carefully listen to each other. But I think there are other ways of having a dialogue. For me, a dialogue is not only a setting where people sit and talk. In a dialogue, we are looking for each other's point of view. And there are ways, different ways to have such a dialogue. The last five years, I was involved in this large, it's already mentioned, large research program, Independence, Decolonization, Violence and War, in Indonesia, 1945-1950. For me, it was essential that we work together with our Indonesian colleagues in this program. For me, it was a kind of dialogue. Maybe this was not, uh, this was most applicable for the project and the book that I was involved in. But I think overall it functioned also for other researchers as a dialogue. Let me first focus on the project that I was involved in. This was the, what we call the Witnesses and Contemporaries Project. In my contribution for the dialogue conference in 2020, I already told about this project. And it's important to know that it was, a, in a way, it was not a, um, it, it, it was not a regular research project. The project was organized from the idea that people who had experienced the war, the period 1945-1949 in Indonesia, could feel the need to tell their stories to the researchers. And in a way, the project was a loquette open for eco documents and life stories of witnesses and contemporaries. And already from the beginning, we were not just waiting for stories, we, but we tried to find them, not only in the Netherlands, but also in Indonesia. In 2020, I gave you some examples. And I then argued that there is not one Dutch and not one Indonesian perspective. If you want to, if you, want to you can still read that contribution and the examples I gave on the JNI website. For me, interviewing all these people and listening to their stories felt like having a dialogue about a specific history and time. This feeling of a dialogue accelerated when we decided to compose, to compile a book based on all the stories we had heard via the Witnesses and Contemporaries project. We, that is me and my colleagues, Evelyn Bruchheim and Stephanie Belfart, felt the need to share these stories with a broader audience. First, because they were worth to be heard. And second, because it was also a way of to take back the story uh, seriously. And the next step when we decided this uh, was how to organize this. We were convinced we should not make a book that only contained written portraits that would make people to a representative for a group, a label it, or one perspective. And most of all, it would reduce this, the stories to, to just stories. So we decided to relate, them, relate to all the materials that we collected and interacted with. We realized that the best interaction with these stories would be if we were joined by an Indonesian colleague. And that's why we invited Odi Chachio from UGM in Jakarta, who had been involved in a research program earlier and who was doing his master in, in the Netherlands to join the team, which he luckily did. We decided to publish our book bilingual. Uh, but because we thought it's good if the Dutch readers consistently will see also the Indonesian text beside their Dutch text, so they know that it's not only a history and it's not only about, about the Dutch. And we called it Sporenvol Betekenis, or Maniti Arti, Traces for Meaning. Now it's published in the Netherlands, and since, I think, four weeks, it's also uh, published by Obor uh, and now available in the... Uh, in the bookshops in, uh, in Indonesia. What followed by creating this book felt like a multi-layered dialogue. It was a dialogue with eco-documents, photo albums, diaries, and letters. It was a dialogue with interviews, single interviews, but also group, group interviews. It was a dialogue among ourselves, but also a dialogue with history and historiography. 
we ask ourselves questions about the history of writing and national canons, about what we saw in the letters or in the monuments. And we try to give an answer, kind of an answer in essays that we wrote, not as a definite answer, but as an inspiration for the reader to think and ask further. The result of a book presenting, uh, <coughs> the, the result is a book presenting a search for traces and meaning, hopping from the Netherlands to Indonesia and vice versa, from people to paper and locations. It was not an attempt to, to tell all the stories. We didn't have the pretension to be complete. We wanted to let experience, uh, experiences, stories and memories be heard in a respectful way, bringing the human measure back into history. The way we approach our project was of course more in line with the dialogue. It had ingredients that created the dialogue. This was uh, different from the program as a whole. The Indonesian and Dutch researchers worked together, but also had their own respective agendas. And that's not strange because coming from different, they came from, or we and they came from different entry points. I think Bambang just showed very clearly how these entry points differed. From the start, the Dutch research was focused on the Dutch violence in Indonesia 1945-1949. Uh, and the funny thing is that in the program, officially, it's always 45-1950. 40, uh, well, I think when it compared to what we discussed with Odi, that for Indonesia, it would be 49, because 40, 1950, Indonesia was already there. Understandably, uh, because the entry point, uh, so they, we started from the, uh, the, the Dutch violence in Indonesia in this period. And that's understandable because the entry point were the regular returning discussions on violence by Dutch army during that period. In 1969, the Dutch government had taken a position that overall the military and the Dutch command had behaved acceptable or decently, but that there were some incidents of violence that could be labeled as excesses. This was a stand that could not be held after uh, again and again new signals of Dutch violence came to the surface. The Dutch had to face that the Dutch army has done what the Dutch army had done in Indonesia. To a large extent was the goal of the research. That was to a large extent the goal of the research for the Dutch. That was the, our entry point. For our Indonesian colleagues, this was not interesting. They knew what the army did. That's part of our Indonesian historiography already. There starts, I think, the dialogue, listening to what the Indonesian historiography start, already told and what was of interest of our for our Indonesian colleagues. But Excuse me, Pastor small... Ridus, uh, yep. we only have one minute left. I know, I know. But only also listening to what the framing of the period meant to those in the dialogue. The program started as decolonization, violence, etc., and independence was added. Among the Dutch researchers and between the Indonesian and Dutch researchers has been discussions about definitions and concepts. Do we talk about war crimes? What do we mean with excessive violence? Was it a decolonization war or was it recolonization or struggle for independence? Should we talk about 45, 40, 50 or 45, 49? Words matter. They express feelings, but also assumptions and perspectives. And of course, these discussions were part of our regular academic discussions, but at a higher level, they were a kind of uh, dialogue. We listened to each other and dealt with history, starting from where we stand today, like Babambang once told me. And I think the impact now the results are available is that in the Netherlands, with the finance of the Dutch army in the period 40. 45-49 Indonesia cannot be denied anymore. Last 4 May, during the official Remembrance Day, the victims of the period 1945-49 explicitly were mentioned, and that war was called a colonial war. This is the result of respectful listening to each other in a complicated dialogue. We are not yet there. The dialogue has to continue, and I think this dialogue should never end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Frida Stalen, for your insightful uh, presentation. I think uh, we, uh, most historians, would uh, learn so much from uh, your presentation, at least in two respects. One is that um, this issue of respectful dialogue, in which we are historians are more familiar with debates and discussion, but uh, this respectful dialogue is really something that we uh, have to think of to in, in, in the discipline. But to do that, the question of listening in safe space in which uh, uh, stories can be related, that's also uh, issues that, again, uh, we all need to uh, strive to learn more about that and to implement that in our practice. 
so I think, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. The following presentation should be uh, Professor Kurasawa Aiko, but uh, she's, uh, um, she's on uh, her way yet. Uh, she's not with us yet. Um, she'll be joining us uh, shortly. And then also as uh, Brett Horton, uh, he will be joining us uh, shortly. So we have to change the order slightly. Um, so I will ask uh, Abdul Wahid, uh, uh, Pa Abdul Wahid, to present first, and then we will have uh, hopefully uh, Professor Kurasawa Aiko, and then uh, question and answer for that. Um, so um, I would like to uh, ask Professor uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid. He's a senior lecturer at the Department of History at Gajah Mada University. He's a he got his uh, PhD from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and he's been really uh, uh, engaged in the project of uh, decolonization and uh, uh, the period. And so he will talk about the Bersiap, um, something that he also has been uh, uh, writing and thinking about. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid to present your uh, paper. Well, uh, thank you so much, Yes. It is uh, quite surprising and it's shocking that I was called to speak earlier than my third actually, <laughs> my schedule. Uh, fortunately, I've already uh, uh, completed my PowerPoint. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> first of all, uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I, I was, I'm, I'm very honored to be, to be part of this occasions, this event. I'm actually also, uh, involved in the beginning of this talk when uh, the, uh, together with NGI at Pasar Kawi in Leiden when we prepare for this meeting. And uh, in this very uh, specific occasions, and, uh, I was asked to talk about initially about Bersia, but uh, I thought that uh, it would be good for me to, to, to put it in much, much more broader context. So I will talk about the violence in general and in, 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 in the revolutionary period. And uh, I try to, to put my, my own perspective, my own note based on my understanding, which probably uh, very much influenced by the Indonesian historiography uh, today, all up to now. So uh, please allow me to, to share my screen. <clears throat> Is it is it is it is it okay? Can you see it? Yes, it's it's there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So I will start from from um, the the first slide. So here my 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 uh, my presentation so that the title is "Violence During the Indonesian Revolutions." Some notes. Uh, I will start with some introduction. So <clears throat> I think uh, in literature, I think uh, since uh, several years ago, there has been some studies who are really focusing on Indonesia and really try to, to reveal the, 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 the characters, the, 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 the violent characters of, 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 uh, of this country and then this literature has mentioned a bit provocatively that uh, Indonesia is among violent country and, and where violence recurrently happened and become normal feature in its history. And even Christian Gerla, for example, uh, one of the uh, prominent scholar has put Indonesia into his category as a very violent society because or due to the fact that uh, uh, populations or local populations suffer from uh, different, you know, uh, uh, violent in mass scale. So uh, the years, if we really want to focus on violence, and the years between 1945 and 1949 is a uh, is is the period indeed. It was or it is very important period for Indonesia because it was uh, uh, the period of the formative period of Indonesian nation state, and the period when Indonesia become a real uh, independent country. But also, it come out, you know, uh, from a very uh, a rather violent process, and uh, in our, our, our historiography, you know, historiography has 
has labeled uh, this period with different uh, attributes, for example, revolution national, revolution social, revolution kemerdekaan, revolution agustus, perang mempertahankan kemerdekaan, etc., etc., which is in a sense actually uh, uh, relying or you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, showing that violence is quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, you know, important feature in that process. Uh, Pak Sartono, Professor Sartono Katujijo, our, our professor, has called this period as masa pergolakan or gegeran yang ditandai oleh serobotan, gedoran, pendaulatan di samping masa perjuangan, situasi politik dalam krisis penuh konflik antar golongan yang siap menggunakan cara-cara radikal dan kekerasan. Of course, Pak Sartono has been prominent as a, a promoter of social approach or social history, so his social perspective uh, about this period really uh, you know uh, uh, focus on society in which violence is very important feature of it and uh, we also have uh, uh, known so far that uh, there are already a, a, a meta narrative or about the Indonesian revolutions uh, first among others are uh, we've seen that this period as a with or with a romantic nationality affairs uh, approach, and it, it appears as, as dominant approach in, in, in understanding this period. And somehow it also become, uh, you know, already a hegemonic narrative with some characteristic. For example, one, it's that state center, the state as a center reflects an integralistic view, emphasizing the idea of national unity, anti-colonial and a bit militaristic. And uh, the 1945, 1949 has been considered as a very important period, very sacred period during which the national leaders and all Indonesian people unified and uh, you know led the nation to and the proclaim independence from the returning Dutch colonial power. And this narrative has been institutionalized in many ways by Indonesian state, especially during the New Order era through school textbook, museum, monument, state rituals, artworks, street names, etc., etc. So we can really see that uh, this is really the important period for Indonesia. And in the post-1998 reformation, for example, when the plea for Pelurus and Sejarah or structuring the history emerged, uh, the hegemonic narrative of the 1945-1949 period was relatively intact and unshakable, really implying that uh, it has been accepted as such by Indonesian people or Indonesian historian. Uh, and uh, the official narrative concerning violence in the 1919 period, I can recall my, myself that uh, the studies about revolution and the violence during the revolutions, it has been produced many of them by Indonesian Australian, but also state agency. But so far, I, I think I can say that it was, or it is only the iconic violence. I, in quote, you know, iconic violence meaning the violence that's considered as very important that were regularly featured in this economic narrative and also in the, you know, a school textbook, etc., etc. Those iconic violence are remembered for their connections, for the fact that it really showed the cruelty of the Dutch and their henchmen, kaki tangan mereka, the traditions of the communist group, for example, in 1948, Mad Universe, the rebellious against the official Republican governments, the ETA movement, and the separatist and regionalism movement, etc. Et so here this what I call as an iconic violence. And of course, there are still many forgotten violence in this period. Our topic of, of our seminar is the forgotten voices and the voice of, of, of the victim of this violence, for example, I think it should be included in this, in this, in this criteria. So uh, there, uh, for example, it's uh, the repercussions toward the, uh, well, quote unquote, the minority groups during the, this period, Chinese, Indian, Ambo, Mihasan, and Eurasians, known as Bersiap, which is, I will discuss a bit later and internal violence between the Republican fighters and militia and army, and especially, for example, the so-called revolusi social or social revolutions, political criminal and other non-political violence, and various kinds of non-physical violence. Because, well, we can also put that in perspective, you know, the, the, the current literature about violence, that there are also various types of violence, non-physical ones are included. 
And uh, civilian fixed team from the populations or commoner were often mentioned under a very non-specific category. And, and they were, uh, uh, you know, referred often as, uh, you know, voluntary sacrifice or um, uh, apa namanya, to the reproduction struggles without, uh, you know, further uh, uh, explanations. And uh, okay, now let let me let me start with uh, with really the 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 the, the, the substantial information. So I mean, uh, well, this it could be uh, some uh, preludes or some context to to the violence that uh, that was happening or that were happening during the, the, the periods. So first, of course, the collapse of the colonial state of the Netherlands in this, uh, the long history of exploitation and repressions, uh, the veil, the so-called indie wear bar propaganda. So it's, this is the propaganda to mobilize Indonesian people, local people to fight behind uh, the, the Dutch colonial power uh, uh, in, in facing the, the, the World War, the Second World War, uh, the, the incoming of the Japanese um, uh, uh, military. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, pro, uh, sorry, uh, campaigns, and then we, there's also important. Obama has already mentioned in the in the in the in the, in the, in the earlier uh, presentations the, the important legacies of the Japanese occupations, especially when when we in the context of, of violence, it's uh, the strengthening identity of Indonesia and anti-Western sentiment, the extensions of political participation of local populations, and total war mobilization and militarizations of the youth. Uh, there are already like uh, in, in some literature mentions the number of this youth who, who had been, you know, uh, 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 trained in military, uh, in military, uh, uh, you know, basic military uh, 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 training. So 200,000 uh, auxiliary soldiers and 1.8 militia, million of militia. And there's also the period of hunger, poverty, and anger. So these all are, you know, really like uh, become the, the, the backdrop of the, the revolutions later on. And then the occupations of the Allies' power, 1945, 1946, and the returning of Dutch colonial power. Well, the occupations, quote unquote, of the Allies' power for Indonesian people, uh, although they have, uh, you know, mandate from the United Nations, but uh, uh, among Indonesian population at the time, they see it as you know, the 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 the, the one who give right to, to to the Dutch, you know, memberikan boncengan kepada sekutu kepada tentara Belanda to come to Indonesia, and uh, there are some rapid political changes uh, happening, or creating a vacuum of power, and, and then the, the, the weakening of, of authorities. And then in the, the same time, much euphoria for being merdeka, being freedom and having daulat or supremacy, the spirit of revolutionary spirit and vengeance, uh, and the spirit of revenge, the rise of ideological parties and visions on Indonesia to be, and then the idea of urgency or the state of emergency. That's our very you know, general idea, but the, the backdrop of the revolutions and the violence that, that, have, that, were, that were happening in, the, in, in sequence in the latter period. And now I'm um, Coming to this uh, part, you know, uh, the types of the 1945-49 violence actually it was quite diverse and, and multilateral in nature. So there are there, there, there were uh, uh, the interstate interstate wars. So the wars between Indonesia and the Dutch, the Indonesia represented by TNI and 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 and, and Badan Perjuangan and the Dutch, uh, also the Nika. And then there are also some internal conflicts among or between Indonesian fighters. And then there are some, you know, effort of, you know, uh, regionalism, separatism, et cetera. Uh, and then the so-called civil war for some peoples and then criminality and non-political violence. So basically we cannot really like, you know, uh, uh, understand this period as a hegemonous, as a, a hegemonous in terms of violence. So there are, variety type of violence. And from a victim perspective, according to uh, Remco Rabin, there are five types of violence, five victims of violence. The first one is the military casualties during the confrontations. And then the second one is the killing of special military or paramilitary strategies. The third one is collateral civilian casualties 
The, the fourth one is casualties of a systematic Indonesian violence against minority groups. And the number five is the fixing of Indonesian internal conflicts. And these types of violence, the five of them could happen in sequence and sometimes intertwine and then and many times also triggering each other and were often involving various group of populations. Uh, <clears throat> and how about the nature of the violence, the scale, the intensity and the performativity and the characteristic of violence? There are some literature or, or, uh, already there and I just tried to summarize them. So uh, Go ahead. we only have one minute more. Thank you. One minute, my God. Okay. So <laughs> there are violence as we call as excessive and structural violence and the current, the latest uh, project from the Dutch has mentioned this and then the external and indescriptive violence and then mass and genocidal violence, asymmetric violence and survival violence. And, and there's also but the Bersia violence, which is actually the violence again, certain group of minority. And from the Dutch perspective, on the Dutch historiography, it was the, the violence against or perpetrated against the Russians and the Dutch. Some people has already, some scholar have already, you know, discussed about this. There are several uh, uh, versions, there are several few about it, and then also some some international scholars also have, you know, discussed about the 1948 violence, the Madian affairs, as a early Cold War and then the Civil War, uh, Katmaker and uh, Harry Puzer. And I think the the, 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 the most the, the, another important aspect of the of the, the discussion about violence is the victim. Who actually the victim? And so far, it's very difficult to find a, a systematic, uh, you know, and, and reliable calculations about the, about the victims because there are some generalizations and political propaganda about it. There are some cultural strain and and contentious way in defining who actually the victim was. And so far, there are some literature who try to, to, to calculate the, 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 the large, the, the scale of the, the, the victims. Here, the numbers, uh, all of you can read it. So ranging from 100,000 Indonesians and then until 1 million. And uh, the latest one is uh, like uh, almost uh, 100,000 Indonesians were killed. But yet, it is still very unclear about the, 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 who, are, uh, who are these people. And no, I think uh, the, the rest are you know, my suggestions about uh, the need to, to do further research in detail in a much more uh, critical way. And also we, uh, because we, we need to diversify the narrative of, about the revolutions and the, the, the critical understanding about it and the passing generations and also the relevance of this period for Indonesian today and tomorrow and for new generations. I think uh, that's all because I have already won. I have, uh, I, I could do justice with the time that I was given by the, the, the moderator. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Pak Diaz. Thank you very much, Pak Wahid. Um, I would like to apologize for this. Uh, the, you, you have been moved earlier, but uh, I think you are well prepared for that. Um, and I think uh, you bring some uh, important issues there. Uh, I think one of the different diverse ways of looking at violence and uh, how people remember or not remember those violence choose not to remember those violence the so-called iconic violence as also as opposed as opposed to forgotten violence and the diverse uh, the different types of violence and again this is really a, a, a revealing uh, aspects of of uh, the revolution that and not uh, as you put it, it's mostly forgotten for uh, various uh, reasons. Um, because of the uh, move of the presentation, we would like to have a question and answer session uh, now. So uh, I would like to invite uh, everybody to raise issues or questions for the three presenters that have been uh, giving their talk, uh, Professor Bambang, Professor Fridus Stalen, and uh, uh, Abdul Wahid, Dr. Abdul Wahid. So if you have questions, you have, uh, you need clarifications, please raise hand, or you can uh, type something in the chat and then we will try to accommodate uh, that um, as, as well. Uh, so, and we have uh, about 15 minutes for this as well. We are still waiting for uh, Professor Kurasawa, Aiko, and also for uh, Brett Horton um, for the next session, that is. Please, uh, so you have any questions? Any? Uh... 
<clears throat> Any uh, topics to raise? Anybody wants to start, perhaps? Yeah. We have quite a lot of uh, topics to discuss uh, at the moment, so if anybody. Maybe I could start something with Pak Wahid. Could you maybe add one more category as opposed to iconic and forgotten violence, but also um, justified violence as be seen by either those who are the perpetrators or the others want to remember? Because that's also another thing that um, uh, has been raised in, in the 1990s. Uh, five, six, seven uh, violence across Indonesia. First of all, there's a discussion that no, there's no violence, it's just exaggeration by the media. But then uh, later on, it switched that yes, there was violence, but it was justified because whatever reasons they come up with. So uh, could you add another aspect to that, pa Wahid, maybe? Well, thank you, Pat. Yes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, justified violence, is there any? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think it's, it's not just but the way the perpetrators trying to justify their actions. And okay. then they will so say, in that no. sense, then actually, uh, yeah. of course, uh, you know, perpetrators always have their own reasons uh, to, to justify their actions. But if, you, if, if we are, uh, it's too risky for us as a scholar to, 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 to put it as a label because I don't think uh, any kind of violence is justified. Uh, what we can see that there are indeed uh, some violence who are part of the part of the uh, what you call it uh, official or part of the strategy, for example, military strategy, and that's maybe well uh, as as a as a researcher we can we can see it as you know kind of approval. There are some approval of that, and that's actually the idea from from our college in the Netherlands. Who says that actually there are some you know the, the violence happenings in, in Indonesia during the period is structural because it, there are some kind of you know of rubble there are kind of same of you know uh, uh, you know a comment of chain of comments following the chain of command and uh, uh, well according to them it's still in the corridor of laws or, or, or justified in that sense and uh, but as a Category, I think, as a as a research category, is too risky to, to, to say that. But, but yes, I'm afraid, uh, uh, and uh, because uh, 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 you know, it, it could have also mixed up some between morality and 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 uh, political motive, etc., etc. And then uh, I think a historian can do that. Um, and and <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, that's that's all my, my race one, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, but uh, I think yeah, the, the topic of violence is always difficult to tackle, and uh, I think you you did just uh, great in that presentation. Any question? Oh, there is one from Pa Andi Swirta uh, um, and uh, to Pa Wahid whether the violence in the time of Indonesian Revolution is the legacy of war policy of Japanese occupation in Indonesia. Or is it to be one of the character of Indonesian people who like doing the violence, such as Ran Amo? Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, thank you for, for, for the questions. Uh, I think uh, that's also another, another, another issue, uh, which is uh, always become a source of debate among, among researchers. Uh, the notions about Amok, for example, some people see it as cultural trait or cultural element or, or part of the culture of Indonesia, which is too risky to say. It. I mean, we don't want to say that it was part of our culture, of course, but there are indeed in some, some situations uh, that kind of actions. So I think uh, as a historian, we have to, you have to precisely know the, 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 the occasions or the event or the, the action itself, what kind of context can happen in there. Uh, so we, we can combine structural uh, and, and, and cultural things, and but also immediate and, and 
long term effect or long term factors so uh so uh, some contributing factors of, of that of that violence uh well to some extent for the, another questions and whether uh, the, the japanese the legacy of the japanese period contribute to what is happening in 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 in, in especially the violence during the, the revolution period or uh, we can say yes of course there are some legacy as as mentioned uh, you know the the spirit of revolutionary even you know has been there and and the, the anti-western and then the militarization of the youth uh the, the, the uh, you know heigo keibo and seinen and etc and then the 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 hatred against again white people and it's also cultivated during the, the Japanese period, but again, that that that's still you know uh, we cannot really say it as the as the main elements as the as the essence of the, or, or the main factors of the element. It just may be contributing factors. There are other elements, and that, and we have to to, to see it uh, in in a very critical way. And we cannot really say okay, this is the only explanatory explanatory factors that causing uh, you know certain violence in that period. It could anything you know happenings and 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 uh, what uh, researchers do normally just to try to understand it and uh, you know make comparison between it and see the pattern whether there are some pattern uh, of violence in there and they can put it in some you know similar categories just to understand it of course but of course your yeah, each violence could have very uh, different explanations it have different causes and, and and contributing factors and could have also different legacies. At least, I think that that's my answer, but yes. Sorry. Thank you, Pa. Um, I think that's really uh, already responding to some of the points raised by pa Andi Svirta. There is uh, another question from uh, Linawati Siddhartha, uh, which I think uh, can be raised to Prof. Bambang and also Pa Wahid. But maybe I also would like to uh, ask Prof. Lambang Purwanto to respond to these questions. Are younger generation of Indonesians interested in reviewing or questioning this romantic nationalistic way of looking at the 1945-1950? Or are a curiosity of uh, looking at different perspectives? Um, um, uh, maybe Prof. Lambang Purwanto could, would like to respond to that. <coughs> Bambang. Oh. Yeah, you. Oh. It's still mute, but. Uh, uh, oops. Let me see. Can maybe can anybody help us with the Yeah, no, I mean, uh, no, I, I, I cannot represent the, the younger generation. I mean, that, that's that's really the, the, the question because I'm not a younger generation. You know, it's, it's definitely you have to ask the younger generation for this kind of, of question. <laughs> but if you if you are talking about the, uh, you know, if you are talking about the the uh, what you call curiosity or looking at difference, I think I have done it a lot in my writing my latest uh, uh, my latest article um, on this in compass a few uh, uh, a few months ago it, it's really uh, talking about all these kind of things you know uh, it's not about the romantic things but I think there is a very I mean we we as scholar you know uh, looking at to this uh, uh, period it's totally wrong I think because it happened everywhere. There was always violence in any kind of war, in any kind of people. Even if you are a, you know, a footballer, 
you know, you, when you watch uh, uh, football, you know, uh, even the Ma Manchester City uh, fans even did uh, violence when even they they won the 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 the, the, the champ they become the champion. Uh, you know, uh, so it, it happened. You cannot say that's because of the Indonesian. This is because of the, it happened everywhere. So that is totally wrong question. I think we have to ask the, 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 the different question, how to understand this, you know, because I just read, uh, 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 you know, a, a, re, a study by Dutch uh, uh, scholars in early nine, late 1945, uh, uh, that's 1946, it's about, about 1946, 1947. <clears throat> and, and, and exactly, you know, they, how they created yeah, the, the narrative of the Indonesian uh, 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 concerning this, this period. So I think uh, we have to ask different question on, on this, I think. That's that's my 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 uh, response to, to to this kind of question. Yeah. Okay. Um, terima kasih, Pak, uh, Prof. Uh, Bambang. Um, there is a question for Pak Fridus. Uh, if uh, I think would be the last question for this session. You have conversation and dialogue with Indonesian people about that violence, which is from Indonesian perspective. What about your perspective about that dialogue? <coughs> uh, Prof. Friedrich Thailand? I think it's exactly happened to to previous yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's it's uh, um, the problem with modern dialogue on the internet is that we have to collectively be unmuted, <laughs> otherwise people will start screaming to their children or uh, <laughs> that will interfere with the dialogue. So it's it's something. Uh, so that's why the host has always to has to unmute us. <clears throat> um, the qu question is about. My perspective of the dialogue, uh, I, I'm not sure how to understand this question, uh, but if it comes to what I learn from the dialogue uh, is, I think this, I'm, I'm learning every day. Uh, <clears throat> and my, my perspective on the dialogue is that, uh, what, in fact, what Papa Mang said, I want to understand what happened. Uh, don't make it unique. Uh, the violence that happened in 1945 is, 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 is happened to, it, in 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 a lot of lot of other countries, uh, when uh, colonizers try to come come back, or uh, when the colonization process were, were going on, so I think this is it's important to see where there are some differences, but also to understand how things worked and the framing of history. And I think that is why it is really uh, has to do with today, because today we are not just looking for what happened exactly happened back then. But, <clears throat> so we're not just for the facts, but we have this dialogue also to understand how everything was framed. Um, so like Papa Bang said, he, he read this book on how the Dutch tried to, to write and to, to frame or, and how Indonesia was reacting. And it was part of the writing of historiography and legitimizing of what the Dutch were, were doing. And I think this is always also something. So one of the things of looking and having this dialogue is to understand what kind of glasses and framing we used to have looking at this <clears throat> and still have looking at, at this period. One of the things that I started to think about, and I, I wrote it down when uh, while, he was, while he was talking about Bersiap, we had this recent debate on the Bersiap in the Netherlands when Bonnie said Bersiap, Bersiap is a, a kind of racist uh, notion where the Indonesians are depicted as a a cruel and and a violent uh, group of people, and it let, and it justifies or legitimizes the <coughs> the entrance of the Dutch, uh, but there's uh, the Dutch that's military, but there's um, there's something else with with talking about this Bersiap in the Netherlands. 
they bear up. They said it's not just against the Indo-Europeans, but it's also those people who supported the Dutch, so the Chinese and the Ambonese. And there's a tendency of of including all inter-Indonesian violence that comes with change of you know systems and change of of and, and a change of historical relations <coughs> and systems. Um, so that there's a, a tendency to include also every every form of violence that was taking place between, in, in let's say, August until the, uh, 1955, uh, 45 until uh, some beginning of 1946. And by doing this, <clears throat> in fact, the discussion of Bersiab is uh, claiming the Dutch narrative that this was still a, still a colony. <clears throat> so it was not recognized, it's not a recognition of, of uh, violence that comes with change of power and, 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 and the establishment of, of new power relations, but it's trying to, it's also about the ownership of, uh, of that history. Uh, and I think that's, it's, so that's why we still have to continue discussing and seeing what kind of glasses that we put on looking at this. So this, <clears throat> my perspective on this, on this dialogue is it should, it should continue. Uh, and and uh, because this only helps us to not only understand what happened back then, but also to see <clears throat> how we were raised and educated in our own biased vision on on this period. And I hope that at some point we we can go beyond that biased vision and vision. And I'm not heading for a shared reading of the history, but a respectful understanding of how everybody was in it. I hope that to some extent answers the question. I think it, it does. And uh, I think with that notes, we have to uh, uh, conclude the question and answer session for this uh, uh, session. Um, and I would like to thank all the three presenters, uh, Professor Bambang, Professor Fridus, and Dr. Abdul Wahid for their presentations. And uh, I'm sure there will be more questions that uh, will be raised, uh, hopefully uh, in the chat section in which uh, hopefully can be responded uh, individually. Uh, we will move uh, uh, directly to the next session in which uh, we will look at the forgotten groups during Japanese uh, occupation. We will start the presentation with Professor William Bradley Horton. Uh, is a, a long lost friend of mine. Uh, we know each other for many years uh, before. And from the beginning, he already showed very uh, keen interest in Indonesian literature. And that has been really the, his, to put uh, Professor Frieda's uh, uh, term, uh, looking glass at the way, uh, the, the way uh, Indonesian society uh, operates throughout the history. He is now teaching at uh, Akita University in Japan. And so I'm so happy to see uh, Mas Broto, uh, Professor Bradley Horton. Uh, and uh, please, you have 15 minutes um, to present. And uh, yes, sir, uh, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. And yes, a very wonderful introduction. I'm very happy to see you again. Um, also very happy to have been invited uh, today to, to talk. Um, I'm, I have to apologize for not being able to hear all of the presentations before, just some of the discussion. Um, unfortunately, my university is alive with classes and faculty meetings, uh, and uh, it is somewhat difficult um, in my position to get out of some of them. So um, let me share my PowerPoint, such as it is, and we'll start from there. Um, Okay, uh, so today my subject is actually the um, part of the total title for this program. And so in keeping with that, I really wanted to consider the term uh, forgotten groups uh, in talking about this. And I've spent a lot of time, well, while my beginning, the beginning of my research was always working from literature as uh, 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 Batias has mentioned earlier, but um, increasingly, I've been looking at the you know, Japanese occupation as a critical point, both because it itself is often forgotten, uh, and also I think it's in a critical turning point in Indonesian history. So um, now part of 
what we get in looking for something that's forgotten as something new. And just as a way of starting today, I thought I would show you the cover of the special issues of two newspapers published on Java um, after one year of the occupation, or actually about 13 months after the occupation, one year of the publication of these newspapers. The first one on the left side is Asia Raya, published in Jakarta. Uh, and here, the image, besides having a newspaper in the background labeled Asia Raya, um, you also have the image of camouflage soldiers armed with bayonets and rifles, uh, a very, very common image that we would expect to see during war and uh, during World War II. On the right side for the Sinai Baru issue, which is published in Samarang, you see something very different. There are Japanese flags, but nowhere is there evidence of the war. Rather than that, you see economic activity. You see farming activity. You can see uh, machine work factories. Uh, you can also see people doing demonstrations, lots of different activities. And this is fitting with actually the editor, Parada Harahap's own interest in, uh, in economics. However, this is not an Im image that we normally get of the Japanese occupation. And so um, in looking at things and finding something new, we may discover what we have forgotten. Now, forgotten groups versus understudied groups, both something that's very important for us to work on and both represented very well, I think, in the uh, presentations that we're going to hear. And so I just wanna have us remember, first of all, that forgotten literally is a black box of nothingness. It's something that we really don't see or hear. On the other hand, an understudied or misunderstood subject could be talked about, could be criticized, could include demands to be remembered, complaints about being forgotten. All of those things might be part of being understood or misunderstood. And there's lots of subjects that could fit this. Uh, most obvious for the Japanese occupation would be comfort woman, very well talked about everywhere, but somehow everyone feels that it's not sufficiently talked about. And also things like the Romusha, who are also talked about, especially in Indonesia and in Japan, even the Netherlands, uh, but uh, our knowledge of them is insufficient and people feel that. But th there is a difference between these, both in scholarship, whether the main uh, part of scholarship or whether it's just in terms of uh, minor studies that the students do, or public discourse. All of them are important, I think. So in then approaching this, the first step is what is actually remembered? And here I wanna talk about the global discourses. I think this, this is all very rough, just a starting point for us to think about uh, global discourses. Some of the things that are talked about just about everywhere, when you mention Japanese occupation, the Japanese military victimized Indonesians and Europeans specifically comfort women, POWs. Those are things that appear in discourses just about anywhere. But then you also have national memories that as was mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Professor uh, Frido said, there's a difference between the Netherlands and Indonesia, at least in the readings, but not just in the reading, but also in what people remember. Indonesian national memories, just very roughly, um, and mentioning groups more than anything else. Um, abusive Japanese soldiers, the image of soldiers hitting people, yelling bakayaro uh, and the like are things that are very common Im images, whether in literature, film, or even in historical literature. Comfort women, or perhaps even nyai, there were comparable things in the Japanese occupation, although it's very hard to document. Uh, Romusha the Peta army on Java, the four Indonesian leaders on Java, the deliberative bodies, particularly on Java, uh, that led to the formation of the Republic of Indonesia uh, after the Declaration of Independence on the 17th of August, 1945. So all of these are things that are pretty well known and in, they're in the textbooks, they're in other materials, and they're in a range of different historical studies. Dutch memories, abuse of Japanese soldiers, a very common point uh, with in Indonesia, I think. European women and children in camps, internment camps, 
something that is absent from Indonesian images. POWs in uh, camps or in labor sites taken off to the Thai Burma Railway or working on the railways in Sumatra or even sent all the way to Japan to work in coal mines. Comfort women. Eurasians outside of the camps. And Indonesians as a general group. On the other hand, in Japan, you have a slight difference in some of the things. Army and Navy would be talked about separately. Individuals would play more of a role in those uh, images. Comfort women still talked about. Romusha still talked about. Indonesian as an undifferentiated category still appear. But then you have a wide range of images and groups that are talked about. And the reason is in Japan, August and December are kind of festivals of publication or uh, documentaries for NHK and other TV uh, stations who compete to put out new documentaries and re replay old documentaries about the end of the war, the beginning of the war, different subjects related to the war. And so you actually do see a lot of different things that appear there. And so naturally we have some things that are um, forgotten in one place, but remembered elsewhere. And I just pulled up one, uh, Eurasians uh, and Europeans living outside of the camps, which are remembered and talked about in the Netherlands, but very much missing from Indonesia. Um, families are separated. The difficulty of life could be talked about. In uh, Dutch people's participation in the Indonesian world, a connecting point to the uh, revolutionary and post-revolutionary period. And here I put the registration card for foreigners belonging to uh, Friedrich Fischer, um, a friend from the archival world in Den Haag, uh, absolutely wonderful friend of the archive and a friend of, of mine as well. I'm very happy that KITLV put it up. I couldn't find it now, but luckily someone had spread it around and so I had a copy of it. Um, but he was in Surabaya outside of the camps while his family members were inside of the camps. And you can see he's working at, in, the fact, in an ice factory. And so you can start to get a picture of his involvement in economic activity then in Surabaya. And you get a new picture of connecting up Europeans and Indonesians during this period when we assume there are no European and Indonesian connections. Um, internees, um, this leads to the question of internees that are talked about in the Netherlands, but not so much in Indonesia until they're released in 1945. Uh, but it's something, the who, what, where, when would be something that might really help Indonesians to understand a little bit more of what's happening, not just on Java, but in Sumatra and in Sulawesi and in other places as well. And so I wanna go on to just a sample of some of the millions of different subjects um, the millions of different groups that are forgotten. And one of them that I have studied is Japanese women. And I ran into this because first because of magazines noticing that there were a few women in them, but also when I was teaching, teaching some English in a factory, um, a clothing factory and talked to one of the directors, the head of the office, his aunt had been on Java. Oh no, sorry, it had been on Bali, but she had passed away already and no one knew what he, she had been doing there. I talked to one of my students when I was teaching English at, a, at another college and who was working with me a little bit. And her bro brother's wife's grandmother had been on Java. And so just in uh, right, my- uh, right. This is presumably in Japan, right? You're talking about is, Japan. These people, no, Japanese women in, in well, I'm talking about my, my being in Japan, yes. However, um, the women were during the war in Indonesia, in Java. So, um, so anyway, these connecting points that just made it very clear that there were a number of Japanese women on Java, but yet they appear nowhere. Uh, Professor Kurosawa is one of the only people who's done any research about it at all. And that's only in Japanese. Uh, and so here on the left side, we have a Japanese writer who is doing a homestay for one or two days in Tretes. Uh, we have Navy, uh, employees um, meeting with Indonesian, other Indonesian women in a formal setting. Uh, some uh, in a Japanese woman who married to 
an important Indonesian student at that time in, in Japan. But then uh, this is actually, I believe, a picture in uh, Padang. Oh, no, no, it's in Java, in Bandung, after they were released from internment in 1942 by the J Japanese army. Um, then the next picture to the right is uh, the group of uh, employees of Gunse Kambu on a little trip uh, in within uh, Jakarta, and then a teacher on the far right hand side teaching, I think, Japanese at that point. So we have a whole bunch of things that, and this is actually something that's really important because if we have an image of, uh, of the Japanese occupation as a bunch of male soldiers coming down, and the reason why they can actually create an, a Yamfu system, a comfort women system, or can have Nyais is because there's no Japanese women to police their morality, to use Ann Stoller's uh, terms. Well, there were some Japanese women there. And so now we have to think about it. We can also see the interactions between Japanese women and Indonesians. Was it a lot? Was it a little? Where did it take place? How did it take place? So many different questions. But on the same subject, Indonesian women are never talked about. They're forgotten, but they're. Um, the women's movement fighting uh, illiteracy, especially in the countryside, uh, but also uh, they were talked about as laborers, as potential fighters, um, lots of different uh, activities that they were involved in. I think I'm down to a, just a couple minutes, so let me try to go through quickly. Uh, ho homeless, I don't have any images here that I could present, but it was talked about in the early occupation. We might be able to find out more about them. What happened to them? There were a lot in the colonial period at the end the unemployed, um, the sick people. And here are some pictures mostly related to uh, sick people in uh, TBC or uh, mental institutions. Uh, but there, what was happening with their lives? What were the connections? So many different subjects. Teachers, I had a picture of a Japanese teacher. And as I looked for Indonesian teachers, I find no pictures. Children, yes. But Children are not talked about either. And this is really important because a whole generation of people had experiences that may be at variation with the discourses about the war. The memories of singing particularly are things that uh, come out in interviews. But here in the images, you can see a lot of different things that they're engaged in, starting points that try to imagine what was life, life like for different groups of children. Uh, and then everything related to Eastern Indonesia. And uh, here on the right side is uh, a picture from a Makassar published children's magazine, the only specifically children's magazine that was published in Indonesia during the war. Uh, and other, um, there's just so many different subjects that could be covered because largely Sumatra and Java are what we talk about in the occupation. And so the groups of people here, if, sorry, let me stop this, the, the many different groups of people that we can uh, look at all provide us with a very different perspective, a very different chance for connecting points, for things to imagine and to break down the stereotypes or the caricatures that we have of the occupation. And as a final thought, I just wanted to mention yesterday in a, a conference in Leiden, uh, about the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of Indonesia, the PKI. The only paper that I think that referred to the Japanese occupation, a wonderful paper, but just closed. Um, it closed in 1942, but with a few comments about the occupation that just immediately se seemed as cartoon caricatures. And again, it's the same thing. And so um, when we start to imagine these forgotten groups, that's where we start to get a new history and new connecting points. So thank you very much. And I am looking forward to hearing different questions and seeing if I can expand on this. Oh, thank you, Brett, uh, uh, Professor Horton. I think uh, some of the themes that you mentioned also already touched upon, uh, and then we can see a uh, kind of a, a, a thread throughout this uh, conference for the day, uh, question of forgetting, uh, forgotten uh, and, and forgetting as well. 
and then selective memories, the kind of memories that people have and remembrance. So that's that's a fascination, a fascinating presentation that you give us. We apparently are just being warned that uh, the way the panel, oh no, no, the, the conference now organized is that we will have immediately question and answer after uh, uh, your presentation. Uh, unlike the one that the keynote speakers earlier, uh, the question and answer after three presentations, but now after one, we have a question and answer session. So if you have, uh, if uh, our uh, participants have questions, please uh, raise hand or uh, write something in the chat, preferably if you can raise hand and uh, direct the question uh, to uh, Professor Horton. Anybody? And I, I can assure you uh, uh, from past experience, if you, you can ask anything to Professor Horton and we have uh, endless discussion for hours. And that has been uh, the joy of our uh, experience in the past uh, in various parts of the world. So please, if anybody have questions. I'm even happy with questions in any language, except for mm, Dutch, I'm kind of iffy on. Yeah, <laughs> that too. I think, uh, please, uh, Bisa Bahasa Indonesia or Nihongo or, uh, I don't know, uh, Andi Suirta, please, uh, you have the, yeah. And then after that, uh, uh, I, Linawati. Andi uh, you have to unmute. Uh, I'm not sure who can admit you. Maybe the host or the master host. Or uh... okay, thank you very much, the moderator. So sorry if my language is not good. <laughs> very interesting presentation, uh, Mr. Brad Hatton. But I would like to make the maybe the comment that many group in the Indonesian community in the time of Japanese occupation can collaborate because there's the one language in this case is in the Bahasa Indonesia. Meanwhile, the Dutch language is forbidden for the Japanese occupation. And the, the Japanese language also not yet using all to Indonesian people. So I think it is important in the time of Japanese occupation about the policy, about the channel opportunity to Indonesian people to use the Bahasa Indonesia as the Bahasa Persatuan. So I think in this case, it's Japanese occupation is the big role in promote the Bahasa Indonesia as the medium for cooperation and collaboration among the many group in Indonesia, comparing with the, the position and role of Sumpah Pemuda in, in the Dutch colonial government. I think the Sumpah Pemuda is just the, the idle statement, but not implemented in the, in, in the time of uh, in Indonesian community in the time. So I, I think just want to uh, what is it is my opinion that uh, many group in indonesia can collaborate with each other because they are the one language in this case is indonesian language in the time of japanese occupation so uh, uh, this is my, my opinion thank you <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. i think that's a wonderful uh, uh, issue there that question of language i think yeah pa, pa, Brett, pa Horton, please yeah, that's a, the the use of Indonesian language, the elimination of, for example, Dutch periodicals. The last one I think was published in Surabaya very briefly in 1942 until the mid mid year, uh, and then that also disappeared. Uh, and so there were no Dutch media available for the elite that might still want to use it. And so, at least in public forums, uh, any public forums, Indonesian was the one medium um, all over the archipelago archipelago basically uh, and at least in many contexts and for publication certainly uh, except for the few Sundanese Javanese and uh, Maduri's publications on Java in 1944 to 1945 the weekly publications other than that everything was in Indonesian and the efforts to increase the vocabulary to systematically improve the language uh, are very, very striking. And that's actually one thing that I would like to study. But the connecting of different groups, as you mentioned, uh, is one thing that 
perhaps be begins in a new way during, this, uh, during the Japanese occupation period. Okay, uh, there is a question in the chat space uh, from, again, from Linawati Siddhartha. Any uh, uh, experience of violence among, what about the experience of violence as perpetrators, as a spectator among Japanese soldiers? I think. Um, um, I'm not sure exactly how to address that. Uh, the, the existence of violence is, of course, something that is. Um, most oftenly noted uh, in uh, Indonesian and I think Dutch recollections. It's less so in Japan, but it's not non-existent. Uh, it's one of the things that other than personal recollection is, is, is very, very difficult to document. Um, although there were criticisms in uh, among Japanese uh, I guess you'd say liberal, for lack of a better word, liberal Japanese um, individuals in 1942, looking at the act actions of soldiers. And they were critical of other, and it appears somewhat in the Japanese pr press uh, in Java, uh, trying to uh, straighten out their behavior. And so we can pick up a, a, a little bit of echoes of some of the recognition of problems with this. Uh, but, um, and, and also in, rec in memoirs written by Japanese, it appears as well, which provides us with a little bit of a different perspective, but you'll find little other archival documentation. Um, and so it's, it's a difficult thing to deal with, although it's obviously in, for many people, it's not the most important element of the lived experience of the occupation at that time, but it was critical in various ways at that time and even more so after the war in shaping recollections of the war. Uh, you know, it's known to have been some of the points where certain individuals kind of turned away from optimistic collaboration with Japanese and more towards kind of neutral uh, collaboration with Japanese that, that when they saw relatives or they themselves were abused, that that, that was kind of a point where they, this isn't what it's supposed to be. Um, but. For most Indonesians, it was not a matter of daily life. It was something that they knew existed and they avoided it. Well, how do we deal with that? A little bit difficult. Um, uh, and it's a little bit difficult in the, different, different than the subject of groups because I'm not sure whether there were particular groups that were targeted with this, except for the Dutch in internment camps might have been more heavily subjected to, to abuse. Again, that's a, again, that's a guess. Um, based on my knowledge, but uh, very likely. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for one question uh, from Muhammad Mahir Rahman. Uh, let me see that. Uh, are there many Dutch interners participated in clandestine activity organized by Japanese resistance in Indonesia? Um, I'm not sure. I get um, Dutch internees um, would by default not be um, participating in clandestine activity uh, organized by Japanese. I'm a little bit confused. This might be a better one to take afterwards. If he if he can contact me, we can talk about it. Um, I'm not sure what because uh, the the inter internees. And the post-war organized by Japanese? Very strange. There, there were Japanese um, organizing uh, resistance after uh, the war, if that's what's meant, but they wouldn't be working with Dutch people. Um, maybe meaning uh, resistance to Japanese? Maybe. In Indonesia? But if they were in the camps, then they would yeah. be doing just passive resistance within the camps, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, mostly. Um, but certainly it wouldn't have much impact outside of the camps. Okay. And let me, let me grab one more very quickly. There was a question from Tanjung Pani um, yes. about the Japanese women. Um, and I can just give you some of the most common roles. Um, the lower level secretarial staffs were, were sometimes women. Um, I think they also, so they, th there was typing and other types of work that needed to be done in Japanese. And those were done generally by younger women. Um, there were also a small number of teachers that were brought into different locations, not just Java, but also other places. 
Um, there were women who were working in private companies because there were a large number of Japanese civilians in Java and other places, which is another subject that's rarely talked about, not just military, but a lot of civilians. And so there were women working there. In Java at the end of the war, I think there were, I think a one count was estimating about a thousand women, perhaps, that were there at that time, um, which is not a small number, but it's a small number compared to the number of soldiers. Okay. Um, we have three minutes to whether you have time to, uh, it would be sufficient to answer a big question from Julian Nangolan. We have still three minutes for you. Okay, the fate of European and Eurasian women during the Japanese occupation. Are they also included in Fujinkai or uh, Jugun Iyamfu? Um, the recruiting of Eurasian women, most of the European women were in camps, but the, the except for the ones that were coming or that had nationalities related to the Axis powers. And so there were Europeans out. I'm not familiar with women, but I'm sure there were some women outside of the camps um, from those countries. There was a Czech doctor, for example, there were various people. Um, Eurasian women, there were. Sometimes there were women, sisters, some inside of the camp and some outside of the camp. Uh, and so um, women outside of the camp were, shall we say, targets of recruitment as marginalized people anywhere in the world. Um, they're very often targets um, of economic, social, political policing pressure to get them to agree to become, for example, prostitutes or something. And they were targets of recruitment for places of prostitution, including um, places that were uh, comfort stations. Uh, and so you do get a little bit of that, um, but most of the women were interned. Um, the ones who were outside were, had less and less freedom of movement um, throughout the war. The same with men as well. And the more European blood you have or the more allied blood that you had, the worse or the more likely you are to be interned. Uh, with that, thank you very much, uh, Professor Horton. And, um... I should uh, ask everybody to give an applause for this presentation. Um, and we will uh, move on to the next uh, presentation. We are lucky we have already Professor Kurasawa Aiko with us. So um, uh, Professor Kurasawa already with us, yes? Okay. Uh, Professor Kurasawa. Okay, uh, uh, the next uh, speaker uh, is Professor Kurasawa Aiko, uh, undoubtedly the authority on the Japanese occupation uh, period in Indonesia. She has written many, many books on that topics, and many of them became classics and become standard readings in, in, in university courses. And recently, she published more in Indonesian, in which give much more access to Indonesian historians and students on that period. So we are very lucky to have Professor Kurasawa to present her uh, thought for today. And uh, uh, you have uh, 15 minutes as well, Professor uh, Kurasawa. Uh, Okay, yes. Yeah, uh, hello. Yes. yes, please. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, Thank I'm you. sorry. I totally misunderstood about time today. And I'm very, very sorry for late participation. Um, okay, I will, I will start uh, reading my paper. Today, I am going to talk about historical and also contemporary situation of study on Japanese occupation of Indonesia in my country, Japan. Speaking about myself, I started study on Japanese occupation history in 1968, 54 years ago during my undergraduate education. At that time, very few Japanese scholars and students intended to work on this topic. The older generation social scientists 
who had actually participated in Japanese rule in Southeast Asia during war as an area specialist, tended to avoid continuing the study on this area, maybe because of trauma. In my high school days, very little was written on its history in textbooks with the excuse that accurate and enough data for teaching had not yet been collected. Consequently, historians of my generation had little chance to be inspired by this topic. Um, I came to be interested in Indonesia in late 1960s, just after the fall of Sukarno regime, when large scale economic expansion by Western world, including Japan, had just started. However, in those days, study on Indonesia in general had not yet been advanced in Japan and very little literature on Indonesia were available. On the other hand, the study was much more advanced in Indonesia, the Netherlands, America, etc. cetera. Uh, Japanese were very behind and there was a big gap in the depth and understanding of Indonesian history. I started to learn from foreign sources on what Japan had done in Indonesia. For example, my BA thesis written in 1970s was based on Nuguroho Noto-san's writing. Then uh, in those days, foreign scholars who were working on history of wartime Indonesia often came to Japan to look for sources. And I was given opportunity to help them in language for archival study and Interest in interviewing. Well, for example, Bill Frederick and Papa Nuguroho Noto Santo came to Japan for interviewing uh, with Japanese people, Japanese informants. And inspired by them, I myself started archival works and interviews in Japan. Um, thus, I was able to write my master thesis in 1972, based mainly on Japanese oral and first-hand written sources. Then I went to Indonesia for a couple of years, mainly to brush up Bahasa Indonesia. And at the same time to do interviews little by little. After that, I decided to continue my PhD study at Cornell University and was enrolled in history department in 1976. After two years of coursework, I started archival research in the Netherlands and interviews research, interview research in Indonesia. After completing my PhD, I further concentrated most of my time and energy in data collecting. In those days, taking pictures were not allowed at archives and I had to pay some 50 cents for a piece of photocopy. And it was a very big burden for a young student. My informants for Indonesian, uh, for interviews, both in Indonesia and Japan, were not confined to those in high and important position during the war, but covered whoever that experienced the period. Since my method was social history, focusing on people's everyday life. Now I realized that it was a good choice that I put priority in interviews with silent commoners who had no chance to write down their experience. After change of century, there were less and less witness of wartime history and thousands of cassette tapes of interviews turned out to be very precious. Now, after more than 50 years of collecting data, now I am in the mid 60s, uh, 
mid 70 years and my office is full of a large pile of transcriptions and cassette tapes of those interviews and also many photocopies from archives. I am now faced with a problem on how to make those accumulated information publicly available and useful. They are in a chaotic condition. My children are not interested in them at all, and they might throw them away if I suddenly die. Therefore, I am feeling urgent necessity to sort them out with making lists and the description so that younger generation historians can have easy access. At the first step in 19, uh, 2018, with financial assistance by Indonesian government and with the help of my Japanese, uh, with help of many Japanese colleagues of mine, I compiled a list of first hand Japanese documents so that non Japanese scholars are able to use them. I mean, documents written in Japanese. The catalog was written in Bahasa Indonesia and published in Indonesia. However, the items listed in the catalog consist only about 10 to 20% of all my collection. I still have a lot more written in Bahasa Indonesia and Dutch, which are mainstream of historical sources of Japanese occupation. So mainstream is not Bahasa Japan, but Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Blanda. It is really time, it is really time and energy consuming work to cover all. With the help of my colleagues, I am now digitalizing not only written documents, but also photos and voices of cassette tapes for more than for more practical preservation. For that purpose, I must file a list with detailed description. Yet the serious problem is now, where are people who will appreciate and actually make use of the outcome of this time consuming work? Now, study on Japanese occupation in Japan, which had once very active in 1980s and early 1970s, is no more popular topic among younger generation in Japan. The one reason is um, general interest on wartime history is this, uh, diminishing among young generations. But more serious um, reason is because um, because that, that um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I repeat it. But more serious reason is the fact that it is a unpleasant topic for Japanese citizen. What time history is unpleasant topic for Japanese citizen. Since mid 1990s, new wave of re new wave to reinterpret wartime history was emerging rapidly with strong influence in Japan. They call themselves new wave of liberal historians. Their main argument is that there are many affirmative aspects of Japanese rule in Asia, which had been forgotten. They interpreted historical events in their own way by stressing good intention and behavior of Japanese, and thus tried to justify Japanese war in Southeast Asia. The writing of this new stream sounded very pleasant to ears of young Japanese who were almost losing confidence in what their ancestors had done. Once they heard compliments on Japanese behavior, those younger generation preferred 
believing it. And they were no more interested in old fashioned conventional history to look wartime history very critically. So this new uh, group of people criticized a conventional method as self-torturing and masochistic. Facing this new way, historical uh, informants, historical witness, informants of our interviews were very pleased. In, in those days, I mean, because, because they have already post, passed away mostly, but in late 1990s, they were still uh, alive and uh, they became very pleased to look at the new wave of historians and became very reluctant to accept interviews with those authentic and old fashioned historians. They wanted to believe that they were sent to Indonesia to help liberation of Indonesians and hoped to be described as such. Once a letter appearing not to collaborate with those unpatriotic scholars like Kurosawa was uh, circulated among those informants. As a, as a consequence, young scholars became hesitant and gradually lost aspiration in digging out such authentic stream of history. This is very discouraging. I hope young scholars, whether Indonesians, Dutch or Japanese, would regain interest in history of wartime Indonesia, and my documents might be some help of some help to stimulate their interest. In the process of listing up sources, I am now realizing how widely the documents are actually available. There are more sources than we usually esteem, yet students simply do not realize that, um, uh, yet uh, students simply not to realize and tend to be discouraged. Indonesian students often complain to me that most of the sources are written in Japanese and access is difficult, but that is not true. Not all documents are written in Japanese. Please be aware that non-Japanese language sources are several times more than Japanese sources and you are welcome to make use of my collection. Thank you very much. Hello, but yes. Hello. Something is wrong with my computer. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I was uh, the Zoom. I had some Zoom problem earlier, and then I walk in again but then I cannot unmute myself. So that's why the long silence. I'm sorry, Professor Kurosawa. Uh, so, um, uh, could you listen to my voice? Yes, 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 uh, you can. So, uh, no we can. problem? Uh, no no okay. problem. Your presentation was fine. Something it's just, is wrong. Uh, 
No, no, no. It's 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 my account that uh, I was locked out uh, by the internet, and then when I walk in again, I could not unmute myself. Uh, somebody has to unmute me. So this is uh, one of the issue of uh, Zoom uh, conference, I guess. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Kurosawa. And I think Professor Kurosawa's fascinating presentations really. Uh, intertwine all those questions of memories and experience and learning history and all this because uh, Professor Kurosawa started with uh, the fact that uh, the, 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 the topic of Japanese occupation was uh, largely unknown during her study time. She has to learn from Nukuroho Nota Susanto or others to learn that. And then now come to the point when the materials are there, the, the, the facilities are there, but there is the, the declining interest for that. So it's, it's um, uh, an issue that, that kind of uh, slightly similar to the question that was raised earlier to Professor Bambang, which was the, how would the younger generation look at that uh, period, the same period that we're, we're talking about. So um, yes, this is uh, really fascinating uh, circumstances, uh, rather unfortunate. But and then you mentioned also about the new wave of liberal liberal historians, which uh, we would like to hear more about that. But because before that, I would like to ask uh, our uh, press, uh, participants to raise a hand or ask question directly, uh, because there are some questions in the chat rooms, but. Uh, maybe you would prefer to ask uh, directly. If if not, I'll try to answer. Uh, try, I'm trying to read them, and then so Professor Kurasawa could respond. To... Um, uh, Oh, from, I just, this is the first time I, I saw, I mean, Professor from Pak Sarkawi, what's your suggestion and recommendation also to young Indonesian history, historians to study the Japanese occupation period in Indonesia to the historical sources in that time is still limited as well, as well as rare. How the narrative of textbooks for secondary schools in Japan related to the period of Japanese occupation in Indonesia and Southeast Asian countries generally? I think that's a question from Pa Andi Swirta. Uh, so I think there are two questions, uh, Professor Kurasawa. One would be the suggestion for young Indonesian historians, because as you mentioned, the materials are, are, are there, but uh, how we could encourage the younger generation to, be, to, to look at this period again? That's one question. And the second one, would be how the narrative of textbooks for secondary schools in Japan uh, relates to the Japanese occupation in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia countries generally. I think there are two questions. Um, the time is yours. Could you please uh, repeat the second question once more? Oh, how the narrative of textbooks for textbook. secondary schools in Japan related to the period of Japanese occupation in Indonesia, particularly in Southeast Asian countries generally i think this is no, more you mean at this time at this time oh, okay okay well as for the textbooks um the situation has not been uh advanced yet the of course it is much better than 50 years ago but still according to me very few and also the content is very conservative uh, for example, as for Jugun Ianfu, just for one example, um, for last maybe 20 years, there was a short mention about Jugun Ianfu in each textbook. But starting from this year, all term uh, Jugun was cut off. Uh, do you understand? Jugun means uh, uh, maybe Brad can explain, uh, accompanying uh, with military forces. It is Jugun. So uh, you may write on Yanfu, 
okay, but don't say it is jugun yangfu. This is just the comfort of women uh, without little, uh, without relation with Japanese military, without official relation with military forces. And that's the guidance from the Japanese Ministry of Education. And all textbooks were changed this year. Oh, this is just uh, one example. So very, uh, getting more and more conservative. It was once very, it had a very good uh, tendency in about uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, 1980s and 90s were much better. But uh, now it's getting uh, less and less description on wartime history. That's my understanding, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Brad can uh, <laughs> revise. And I think I just add to that that um, the 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 textbooks from the from, that are approved by the Ministry of Education are aiming to provide um, information for towards the exams, but uh, for the university, I think, and the the I think the Japanese occupation period falls in the last semester, perhaps, and and yeah. so it's uh, it's of no significance because it will never be put on the exams. <laughs> and because it will be never put on the exams, no one studies it. Uh, and they, instead of that, the schools are more likely to review other sections uh, in order to prepare students for the exams because that's what their main job is. So yes, it's very thin is what I would expect. Um, but if it's being, if World War II is being taught in the schools, it's by teachers who care. And, and so the training of teachers is far more important than the textbooks, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the training of the teachers is also probably very poor in terms of the knowledge of history of World War II. Looking at what I know of Japanese education, I'm very pessimistic about that. So yeah. uh, her, uh, Professor Kurosawa's general conclusions, I think I would support, but I'm not sure whether what's in the textbooks is really critical. Yeah. 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 Right. Very, very pessimistic. I'm very pessimistic about textbooks. Mm. Uh, I, I, we could not hear you, Professor Kurasawa. We could not hear you. I think the, the, the microphone. Microphone is not on. Uh, you can't still. hear my voice. Oh, okay, now we can. Okay. Now oh, we okay, can. okay. Well, sorry, uh, what was your first question? The first question <laughs> was yes, what, yes. what would be your suggestion to revive this interest in Japanese wow. period wow. in Indonesia and elsewhere? What would be your suggestion? So, because as you okay. mentioned, the materials are getting there. It's, it's out there with the digitalized and all sorts of things. But how to revive this interest? Yeah, in just the simple. Uh, believe that there are many documents available, still available. And... Um, they are actually uh, available in Dutch archives, but some of the older documents are now missing. Well, I would say, I should say, missing, really missing or not, I'm not sure. But uh, the, the thing is that when I did my archival, archival work some 40 years ago, there were many, many documents on Japanese occupation. Although there was no great, good list, uh, you know, if we dig out the pile of documents, I sometimes came to find very, very precious documents. And I uh, usually I made photocopies of them. But when I went back to Dutch archives uh, some 20 years ago, because cataloging uh, system has been changed maybe because of that. I couldn't find out those documents again. Uh, sometimes I, would, I wanted to look at those documents once more in the original form, but I couldn't find them. Many, many, many cases. I don't know what happened. Um, Firing system is maybe difficult, different, or something is wrong. So anyway, um, many students now say there are no more new sources, which is very interesting. But that's not true. There are many, many documents which still remain unused by me. 
I made copies, a lot of copies, but maybe 80% of them are not used by me. And I am now ready to offer all of them, if you like. That's why I am digitalizing all of those and making a list catalog. And maybe it will take a few more years, but um, be confident that there are uh, many documents available, not only in Japanese, but in Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Belanda. But because uh, Japanese military administration's official language was not only Japanese, but also Bahasa Indonesia. So many, many documents are written in Bahasa Indonesia. And simply, we don't know that. Maybe we don't, much have, we don't have much access to them, but actually there are many, especially uh, uh, on local history of Java. There were, uh, most of them were written in Bahasa Indonesia, not in Japanese. Hello. So is that okay, Padias? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. My, my battery is kind of off. I need to find charger. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, th as, as I think many years ago, before this decided to uh, uh, put it down, uh, NIOT in the Netherlands put out all the newspapers from Japanese occupation area, uh, period online. And that was also for a short time become a, a source for many works on that. Uh, from the uh, Sulawesi Shimbun and all this uh, Japanese occupation era newspaper. And it was already Aussie art, so we can do search uh, easily. But then it was disappeared due to some legalities, uh, I heard. So that's also, uh, but at least, uh, as you mentioned, the possibility is there that the materials are there. The materials are available, but uh, it's a question of how to encourage more and more people to look at uh, this period in different lights. Uh, thank you, Professor Kurasawa. Um, questions, uh, direct question perhaps? Because I think there is a question from Professor Erviza, but I think it was answered already in your recent uh, uh, answer. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, Raman Narendra asked if uh, how we could update, uh, get, get updates on the progress of your digitalizing, digitizing uh, project of your collections. Is it somewhere it's already completed or is it almost ready or still a long way to go? No, still a long way. <laughs> still a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. And that will be in Japan or in, in... in Japan? Ah, okay. Actually, uh, the, the, the wife of Brad, Mayumi Yamamoto-san, yeah. is organizing that project. Ah. Because of her help and the fund, I am now digitalizing those documents. Oh, okay. Okay. So we can uh, get some news from you and also from Pat Brad uh, yeah. for the updates. Yes. Okay. It's a little bit broader than just uh, Professor uh, Kurosawa's collection. There's other materials as well. So um, it's just eventually will be complicated in making it public to a wide, um, completely open public because of the origin of materials. But for researchers, certainly there will be access available. Look forward to it. <laughs> yes, look forward. But yes, you're muted again. So while he's muted, maybe I could step forward and there's a question from Ramar and is there any, oh, that's already what we, we just addressed. Is there another question? Um, Professor uh, Kurosawa, could you address uh, Rob Sipkin's question about how the uh, civilians in Indonesia during the war are remembered in Japan? How? Yeah, what kind mean? of images and what, how much are they talked about 
in in Jap in Japan. Well, uh, generally speaking, civilians had very good memory on uh, wartime uh, experience in Indonesia. Uh, maybe because uh, mainly because there was no fighting, no not much fighting in Java, and they didn't lose anything and they came back to Japan peacefully. And also the relation with Indonesian uh, colleagues were not so bad. Um, so generally they still keep very good relation. Uh, sorry, they had no more, they don't uh, alive anymore. But when I was doing interviews in 1980s and 90s, they still had a very good uh, relation, actual relation with in former Indonesian colleagues. Do you have the same expression, Brad? I have far fewer interview experience than you do. You know, you have a much wider experience, but uh, certainly I don't have an image of their being traumatized or anything. And what they come out on TV when they're interviewed also tends to be at least not negative, but I don't see that many interviews. Most of the interviews are related to civilians working closely with the military at the end of the war in, in the Navy office or something like that. So uh, I don't know whether the other people are interviewed much beyond you know, your research, of course, but, uh, but uh, in terms of say NHK documentaries, are they, are they interviewed very often? Uh, now the mic is off again or oh, not working. I don't know what's up. We're all having lots of problems. I can't hear you again. Um, yeah. Are yeah. are the uh, are are those civilians interviewed for a lot of the documentaries that appear? Sorry again. <laughs> Could you uh, are, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we both can't hear each other. Your voice is very weak. But are the are the uh, civilians in Japan interviewed for documentary programs? Which documentary program? NHK. NHK or other documentary programs about the wartime period? Oh, I don't think many. Yeah, usually when NHK makes oh. a documentary program. Your, your mic, I think, connect the, the connection of your mic. Uh, okay. We cannot hear you. No, okay. No. So, Very small. Wow. Well. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, when NHK makes documentary films, they usually tend to interview with uh, mil military men or uh, at least uh, gunzoku. What's gunzoku? Um, not military men, but um, those who are working for military government as a bureaucrat. Contractors. I think as soon as I talk, she gets quiet. So um, I will stop talking. Um, uh, military contractors, perhaps, is a good word. And I'm turning off. Yeah. Uh, I think to follow up that question, uh, I hope uh, everybody can hear me. There's a question from Yuli Weyers, uh, questioning why, why there's more attention. Well, it's actually to you, Brett. Uh, why there's more attention on uh, uh, for individuals from the army or navy? So I guess as opposed to non-military, I guess, um, or perhaps um, related to, to difference with other areas uh, in in Indonesia and in uh, the Netherlands. Um, uh, in many cases, in the Japanese individuals are never important. Uh, matter of fact, even the the commander of the Japanese military in Java so in 1945 is mistakenly labeled as Imamura because that's the only <laughs> name that Indonesians know for uh, Japanese military. And in other regions, they no idea. So, so individuals are not part of the story and bringing, uh, um, if you look at discussions even of war crimes, they're in generalities, you don't see the the people on the Japanese side. But on the Japanese side, you do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, that's natural. Um, the Dutch are more likely to see the individual Dutch people. Um, it's easier to get the interviews, the sources, 
uh, and also to find the history relevant. Indonesians are more likely to focus on the Indonesian individuals. And so I think in terms of the individuals, that's the reason why. Uh, but in particular, I was mentioning the absence of, or the differentiation there for the Japanese military, but it's relevant in, in, in each direction to a, a different extent, uh, but it is yeah. relevant. Okay, well, thank you on that note. I think we can conclude this uh, session. Um, and I think because the, the first point that was brought up earlier, how the memory works uh, selectively, uh, who remember what and what is being remembered as uh, Professor Horton just mentioned, uh, what is remembered. And again, the fact that Professor Aiko Krasawa has to learn from elsewhere to study about the Japanese occupation when she was a student. Again, this question of memory and forgetting is being selective. And that is something that uh, uh, also uh, Professor Stalen uh, earlier talked about listening. So I guess uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, thread, the kind of benang merah or the kind of red thread that we will find again in the next session. So again, I would like to ask everybody to applaud Professor Kurosawa and Professor Horton for the presentation. And thank you very much. And we will have a 10 minutes break as according to the schedule. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Brad, to step in while, while I was unmute or mute, uh, muted earlier. And uh, yes, we will see each other again in 10 minutes. We will see in Indonesian time, Indonesian Western time, it's 1550. Uh, uh, we will see each other again. Thank you. And uh, I would like to return uh, to the uh, organizer for the break. Uh, maybe Ibu Mur or somebody else. Yeah, thank you. But we yes, will have 10 uh, minutes break. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have a uh, break time uh, until uh, 10 minutes uh, before, before we start again on 5. Five, uh, five, uh, eight, uh, five, four, five p.m. Yeah, thank you, and see you again.
uh, I think we can start again. Um, the next presenters will be Professor Erwisa Erman from Lippi and Brin, and it will be followed by presentation by uh, Dr. Triwahyuning Mudaryanti from uh, Heritage Society uh, in Depok. And then uh, that this, the next session will be uh, concluded by presentation from uh, Ms. Murdia TMA from UNISAS Erlanga. And then after that, we will go to the next session after another break. And as the previous session, the question and answer will be uh, immediately after the presentation. So uh, is uh, Professor Erwisa already uh, uh, joining us? Oh, okay. Um, Professor Erwisa Erman is a historian from Lippi and Brin, uh, another old friend of mine. We knew each other for many years back in the Netherlands and in Jakarta. And it will be a pleasure to listen to your presentation today on forced labor during uh, the period. And she is, uh, as I mentioned, is a professor, research professor from Lippi, from the Indonesian Research Institute. And she graduated from uh, University of Amsterdam, uh, where she did her uh, PhD. Um, so I will give the time for you, uh, uh, Professor Erwisa, 15 minutes. Uh, the space and time is yours, please. Thank you very much for giving me time to present uh, my paper. You can uh, use uh, or you can, finish your screen. I cannot hear you. Maybe the mic? No. Or is it just me? Yeah. So can you see that? Uh, we cannot, I cannot hear you. I don't know with uh, others. Hello? Oh. Yes. Hello? Please, yes. Hello? Yes, can, can you hear me? please. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Can, please. Thank you very much, uh, Padias, uh, Padias, for giving me time to present my papers. My papers is about labor condition and forced labors in the mining companies uh, during the Japanese uh, military occupation, 1942, 1945. Um, this is the start times I read, I wrote uh, about the uh, Japanese military occupation. The firstly, when I meet uh, Buaiko Kurasawa in Niot, the first time um, I wrote the uh, mining, um, the Dutch and the Dutch and Japanese mining policies, steel mining, and then uh, comfort uh, women um, presented in Korea, and then now is uh, still in mining companies, uh, focusing on labor condition and forced labor. Um, this is uh, sorry. This is some uh, points of my presentation. Uh, there is uh, six points, uh, as you see. Um, uh, the introductions. Uh, I'm I'm going to talk about the problem of written sources. Uh, Buaiko has mentioned that the uh, written sources, a lot of abundant read, uh, written sources, uh, found in um, uh, in in Japan. But that about the uh, written sources, uh, in order to write labor condition for disruptive and turbulent periods. As I mentioned, will not uh, be easy. Firstly, the core of the period are fragmented. Uh, the source is seriously depleted because the Japanese left Indonesia and the Dutch entered the mining town. Large part of the archive mining companies had been burned by both the Japanese and the Dutch. We only find the fragmented information that has survive is not sufficient to trace anything uh, but the various outlines of the labor history in the mining companies. 
Secondly, written records for common people as uh, uh, labor uh, history are generally neglected or reported by state actors if they are regarded as dangerous for state hegemony or for state political instability. And then uh, personal or subjective experience remain hidden. Remain hidden. That's the result of this uh, lack of uh, written records. Many personal and communal experiences remain unrevealed and about how ordinary people feel, experience, behave, and act in the face of uncertain national and international situation. Most of the information recorded in this period was more about political news, such as the situation of war, the formation of government administration, strategy of co and non co of national leaders, and sto stories about the battle in various places. The social history, but the social history of the ordinary people from subaltern perspective uh, is neglected. In terms of subaltern perspective developed by Indian historians and influential in other regions of the world, such as in Germany and Latin America, uh, it is development has been slow in Indonesia. I know some historian knows about that, but the development of uh, subaltern perspective still uh, Undeveloped, as I as I, I can mention, written records on workers tend to be noted as their former activities, such as protests, strikes, and their involvement in trade union and political parties. I mentioned that this formal history of the labor uh, condition of labor politics, whereas informal activities such as form of network through family, ethnicity, religion, and friendship tend to be neglected in understanding about relation and labor politics. Apart from this, subjective experience of the common people remain hidden. They are regarded as people without history, as I mentioned or explained by Eric Wolf. In order to influence uneven, uneven information, Oral history is needed, especially for the Japanese military occupation. Um, and social history of common people who has important role in the process of production, such as mine workers. Uh, this is uh, what I'm going to uh, discuss. I choose the Ombilin coal mine, this part of my dissertation, but then Banka and Billy Tuntin mines. Uh, this is another uh, reset of mines as a case study. Based on uh, all perspective of labor history, more formal, more focusing on trade union, political parties, a voice of labor, labor remain hidden. A new perspective, social uh, history of labors, this is a process of dialogue process interrelationship without ending that is open ending and then uh, how they work uh, we can place it, we can place changes in labor history in relation to political and economic changes in the wider context of both state and company state can change over time company also can change over time because some during the uh, Japanese occupation, company is semi-government or private government. And before that, they set on a company. Time series. Time series is very important to see changes, to see changes in labor condition over time, to see changes over time in labor condition, in labor relation, in labor politics. In order to make balanced pictures, voice of managers, voice of the set and voice of manners, digging can be uh, done by digging through oral history. This is uh, what I have done uh, during uh, my uh, studies about our history. Political and economic uh, context. Strategically speaking, Sumatra was uh, Banka Blitun and Ombilin is uh, located in Sumatra and then I focus on Sumatra. 
Sumatra was extremely important for the Japanese for its proximity to Singapore. It is abandoned agricultural production and also abandoned in mineral resources. This tragic failure can be clearly measured from the Japanese investment in Sumatra, which was about 6.2% of the total Japanese investment in the Southeast Asian occupied area. This investment was divided in between three sectors, agriculture, farming, manufacturing, and mining. Mining, the, the figure of mine, the percentage of mining is quite high. The mining sector undoubtedly is the main priority of the Japanese to exploit its oil resources for loud by coal and subsequently tin, bauxite, and gold. Except bauxite, bauxite is uh, exploited by the Japanese uh, companies before the Japanese uh, military occupation in 1942. The pattern of exploitation also varied in response to these priorities. Oil feed in Palembang fell directly under control of the Japanese military. The Bukit Asam and the Umbilian coal mine were placed under the control of semi-government company, that is Hokkaido Steamship. Whereas other branches were in the hand of private company, such as Furukawa. In order to develop mining sector in Sumatra, particularly in the field of exploration, rehabilitation, and uh, explore, exploitation, in August 1943, the Japanese formed the Sumatran Mining Association, or uh, mentioned in Nihongo, Sumatora Kaigu Kaka. This association located in main, main, its main office in Padang consists of five companies engaged in mining. The principal objective of the organization to improve the industrial policies of the mining companies, which will facilitate the supply of essential fund labor and main of transportation. And also uh, engage in research for development of Sumatra's mineral resources. Unfortunately, any information about the extent to which the mining association relies its programs and to what extent the mining companies were affected, affected by this time to have been lost. This is uh, the, uh, uh, the tables uh, about the Mitsui Mining Company uh, exploit coal in Bukit Asam. Mitsubishi Mining Tin Ore in Bangka, including Bliton and Singkep, Furukawa Mining Company uh, Boxing in Bintan, Hokkaido and Steamship uh, Coal in Ombilin, uh, Mitsue Kosan Kaisa in Simau Bengkulu Exploit Gold. Political and economic context, the mining companies must suffer from a lack of skill labor to manage the mine and to do the actual mining. Also, the Japanese had seriously planned to recruit the Japanese miners to work in Indonesia. That plan never saw the light of day. They are small in number, and they held some of important positions at the central office and acts as overseer as found in the Ombilin coal mine and tin mining in Bangka. The, the Japanese sent two staff of Sumatra to Sumatra to inquire into the possibilities for coal export. They investigated the condition in coal mine. So there are some uh, efforts of the uh, Japanese uh, engineer and uh, technicians uh, to uh, how to export, uh, export mineral resources at uh, max, maximum. In order to solve the problem of skill level shortage, the Japanese promote many Indonesian people that these changes, yeah, changes in mining society to higher position with higher salary than they had ne ever enjoyed before. Uh, for example, Rusli, I have interviewed with Rusli, Shahbuddin, Aziz, and then Rusli, uh, Shahbuddin, later on, uh, after Indonesian independence, Rusli became a director of the company. The Indonesian replaced position of European who had been entered into the prison camp, such as in Bangkinang, Mento, and Palembang. So here is uh, Indo-European, European Indo-European cannot uh, build, uh, work at the mine. And then the Japanese also uh, established mining school, Ko In Yo Seiso. And then in 1990s and then in 2000, 
or relation renewed between Japanese mining engineer and mining school in Sao Linto, even up to the, up to present. Then uh, we are going to talk about labor relation and uh, labor conditions. Labor, labor condition because it's the offices uh, were uh, held by the Indonesian um, people, such as Rusli and uh, his friends. And uh, what they uh, took him in, for example, fields. He feels secure because uh, we, suffer, we, are, we were supervised by uh, Indonesians. And labor in the living condition at the first year of profession till 1943, better than non-mining companies. Therefore, um, many people prefer to work in the mining in order to get a sufficient social insurance, basic thing, rice, tea, coffee, sugar, etc. Uh, this is very, uh, uh, this is the rare uh, 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 found in the uh, outside of the company. But to keep in recruited at the beginning of 1943 from Central Java Solo, together with two, 240 people from Solo and uh, plus from Baya. Uh, with uh, Java to Sawalunto, their status as a free labor. So here is a free labor from forced labor uh, introduced uh, by Dutch by the Dutch government and then changed into free labor. But to him in, he get daily salary and basic need that were very difficult to have it. In short, he worked there very well. Manly when Pak Kobuta. Kubuta is director just arrived at Salunto in 1943. This is the uh, the How about the Bangka Blitun and Singap Island, Singap tin mining, and also oil industry uh, such as studied by Bambang, Pak Bambang, and Teni Budianti. Budianti. Not much different from the Ombilin and not much different from the Bukit Asam coal mine in the context of labor relation, labor condition. But Jamhurs, uh, for instance, uh, more accommodative, not running away from the mine uh, as expressed by uh, as a daily politic of resistance happened in the previous years. By the end of 1943 and the yearly of 1944, labor relations underwent changes. There is also labor migration and shifting of occupation. Why is labor migration? Because the uh, mine workers uh, were uh, sent, it, sent it to Palembang, sent it to Bang in West Sumatra, sent it to Bukit Tinggi, sent it to Padang, sent it to uh, some uh, other towns to work uh, and to construct public facilities. This is uh, happen under the economic and situation also change. Economically speaking, coal and tin mine went through a very unhappy period, a misery due not only to the lack of capital and mining machinery, but also exacerbated by political instability. The Japanese military government more focused to strengthen social economic power to face attack from a light army, including how to maximize production of mining company, exploited labor force under misery uh, condition. So here is a mine, mine accident happened very often and suffered a lot of uh, suffer, a lot of, uh, uh, come, a lot of mine ore suffered from the mine accident. Therefore, this year were characterized by the continuing decline in production and bad working condition. Did this working condition change? Uh, Ibu Erwiza, about uh, only one minute left. Uh, one, okay. Uh, one minute uh, left. Coal production is reduced and labor, labor is also drops. Uh, and how about being, being forced labor? Being forced labor, uh, depend on status for the Japanese Sundanese married and unmarried. If they married, they prefer to uh, stay in uh, uh, the town. But if they unmarried, they uh, uh, prefer to uh, go to outside of the towns to uh, 
airport uh, to public uh, to construct public infrastructure airport airport railways in uh, air, uh, uh, in, in support uh, strategy for survival for the forced labor like Umusa, running away contact with the local people to us to us assistant and a revolution during the following period back to the mine uh, this is also very unusual for the Chinese labor as a rumusha. Uh, Chinese women as produced Chinese 500 Chinese Indonesian mine laborers sent to Palembang and so then uh, southern Chinese Indonesian sent to uh, from Blitung sent to uh, Palembang to uh, indus oil industry. How about strategy for survival? Some, some of them running away from the mine, some of them back to agriculture, uh, planting pepper, rice field, and cutting fish. Basic need from family member who had small uh, ship trading basic need with the other agent. It is illegally. Um, and um, finally, the experience in Indonesian during the Japanese occupation were far more varied than the usual description, description of missionary hunger and physical violence. Most of the Japanese occupation period is described, described by taking a certain distance as if that period was a natural phenomenon or natural disaster. By placing the voice of mine laborers in the context of the development, political and economics, it can be noted that the voice of power miners were strong and has changed. Information on mine laborers from Orostri can fill the gaps and contribute to more wider picture, balance and nuance narrative of history mine of mine laborers. Listening their voice can give new findings of social condition and religion in the world of working class. Lastly, comparative studies about this subject are needed so that sick, uh, this sick description, as uh, Clifford Gis said, the, of the common people can give similarities and differences at various economic sector and places. Thank you very much, uh, Padias. I stop. Yeah. Terima, terima kasih, Ibu Erbisa. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I think from the beginning, you said how difficult it is to uh, mine information from the official records. And I trust that the, the presentation they gave would rely more on the uh, uh, oral interviews uh, that you had to do with them. And that's, uh, yeah, if, if we would love to hear even stories and the stories that you alluded. And that would be a, a fascinating uh, story in itself. Uh, so we have question and answer session uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, please uh, raise hand if you want to ask uh, a question or clarification, or uh, if there are some technical issues, you can also type at the chat section. There is a question from AXO, but I think this is for uh, the previous session, uh, but for this session, any uh, questions? Yeah. Any, please raise hand. While waiting, I think it's obvious that, as uh, Professor Erviza mentioned, um, the uh, the experience of uh, Indonesian during uh, Japanese occupation is diverse, not as monolithic as mm -hmm. one can read in most uh, uh, literature, and that's something that needs to be appreciated and uh, examined as well. There is uh, Hikmatius Fanani. Uh, uh, you would like to, yeah, ask a question? Yes, thank you for the chance, Mr. Elvin. I'm, I am going to ask about the, if the mining condition in there deteriorated in about 1943 or 1944, if I was not mistaken. 
and before that mining comparatively better better in the Japanese occupied Indonesia before that year. I'm I'm curious if this also um, connected with how Japanese wanted to maintain the image of liberator in in the occupied Indonesia since they also want spread propaganda that they freed the Indonesian from the Dutch and suddenly when things go bad they go back from their world and you know making things worse in general thank you uh, i'm sorry either i'm not sure whether my 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 connection or the the, the voices was breaking uh professor elvisa did you get the question yeah. because i could not um, hear it oh okay um let me uh, let me answer the the question that you arise uh this is the about the uh, living condition of the mine during the japanese occupation as um, generally speaking that that the living condition is very uh, very uh, worse so this worse but, and then uh, it's not good and this is general picture uh general picture of the studies uh, 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 have uh, the studies uh, that we have uh, read it but then if we uh, found uh, and then uh, do interview with the uh, people do interview with the people from different uh, places mine workers especially and we uh, get different uh, perspective in the early years of the Japanese occupation, the living condition, the working living condition is very good compared with the 1944, 1945. Uh, because the uh, Hokkaido and steamship mining company, Mitsubishi, Mitsui companies, they prepare uh, for the company prepare uh, social assurance uh, for the, uh, their workers. But then in 1944, in 1945, the situation changed. So here is, uh, uh, we cannot make generalizations over uh, living condition and working condition. This is uh, what I found in my cases. This is new finding. Oh, okay. I hope that responds to some of the questions raised by Igmasius Fanani. Any uh, other you, Yes. Are you satisfied, my yeah. answer? Yeah. Higmasius Fanani, you have follow up question? Disappear. He's still with us. Uh, I am, but yes. Please, uh, there was. I am Murdiati. Oh, yes, Ibu Mur, please. Yeah, uh, it, it was a very interesting, uh, by Elisa, uh, about that your presentation. So I'm curious about have you ever been asked to interview again uh, in the labor? How was the conditions? of the workers be after the revolution spirit because if your presentation only uh, tell us about the 1942 until 1945 but uh, i just want how about the conditions uh, worker conditions of the revolutions thank you during the, i think that during the revolution yeah? not after the revolution yeah, okay, okay. Is nuts. Uh, there is some uh, some point, some important point we can note it uh, for the Jap uh, during the Japanese occupation. Firstly, this is about the social contact, social contact between the mining community miners with the local people. Uh, there is benefit. Social contact is give uh, has given beneficial uh, is given a profit for the uh, mining community where the uh, they can plant, they can use land for planting anything uh, they want to plant. Uh, and then also, uh, can they can be survival 
in order to uh, face a, a disaster. The, the first, uh, this is the first one. Uh, it means that the uh, miners uh, went out of the catch of production. Uh, and then this is, uh, uh, this situation uh, can uh, can be uh, can contribute to the period of the Indonesian independence. I mean, it's uh, during the revolution. During the revolution, the social contact is more between miners and and uh, local people is more intensive than before. Than before, and then uh, uh, this is quite different. This is different from the various from the colonial period, uh, when the, the mining company is still in the catch of production, and now it's went out of the catch of production, making social contact with local people, and then also they can use land uh, for uh, planting rice, for planting uh, uh, vegetable, and for planting anything they want to. Um, also, the Indonesian during the Indonesian Revolution, the situation uh, is not uh, better. But the uh, the strategy for survival of the uh, of the mine uh, workers uh, still uh, still exists, or uh, I think it can be said as strong because it's. Uh, uh, they uh, they can get uh, food uh, from their sawah. They can get food, a vegetable from from from, from a garden, and then uh, even until a uh, uh, economic uh, regional economic crisis in 1990. Uh, uh, in 1998, in 1999, this. Uh, where the uh, mining company stay and live there for generation, and then they have house, they have rice field, they have kebun garden, and so forth and so on. So here is the continuity, uh, the continuity of the uh, uh, use or the use of land of the use. Uh, the continuity is uh, still there. Thank you, Ibu uh, Erwisa. Okay, uh, we still have uh, one or two minutes no, for uh, one last question, if there is a question. I think that is uh, the question, uh, this comment from Matthews. No, I don't have, thank you. I don't know, I do not uh, yeah. know what I mean. Uh, oh. of this. No, I don't. Know. Oh, oh, I mean, he, he, he was the one. Who, uh, well, Prof. Erwisa, he was the one who asked the question earlier. Uh, oh. Yes, okay. uh, and then I asked him whether he has follow-up question, and oh. he don't. He don't. Have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He doesn't have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have. I mean, if there is no more question, maybe you want to have a concluding remark before we end the session, uh, Professor Erwisa. Cost three is needed in order to get, uh, in order to fill a gap uh, between uh, the history of uh, miners, the history of the ordinary people, and the history of the state. So, re interrelationship between state actors, mining companies, and then uh, levels uh, uh, can be uh, related to each other. Um, for the for the uh, Japanese occupation, new finding uh, can be uh, what is that uh, can be done can be done uh, because it's uh, uh, through oral history because oral history uh, can give nuance uh, balance and then a picture of the uh, history. Mm. Can you hear it? Yes. I'm sorry, I think my, my connection is, is breaking. As well. Your connection is broken. 
I'm not sure. Is, is this Professor Elvisas or, or mine? Yeah, that is, uh, I hear your surprise. The third one is comparative studies is needed in order to get similarities and differences between mining companies, between history of mining companies, history of mine workers, and the state actor are involved uh, in that sector. Okay, Professor Eriza, thank you very much. And I should mention also that uh, Professor Eriza was also participating in the uh, oral history project that uh, was mentioned by Frida Stalen, uh, Professor Frida Stalen earlier. So she has also um, make full uh, use of the oral history to, as he, she mentioned, to, uh, to, to add to the official records that is available in the archive. Okay, thank you very much. We should give an applaud to Professor Erviza. Yeah, welcome. Um, we will move to the next presenta uh, presentations. And I was just notified by the organizer that we should have two presentations then after that uh, question and answer, but we have to move uh, a little bit. So the next presentation will be Dr. Tri Wahyuning Mudaryanti. Uh, she will be presenting the pokers during Indonesian revolution. And then after that, she will, uh, the presentation will be followed by a, a, a talk by presentation by Yos Bibisono on literature and forgotten groups. And then we will have question and answer. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Tri Wahyuning Mudaryanti. He was uh, for a long time a lecturer at the History at Universitas Indonesia. And now she's active at the uh, uh, Depok uh, Heritage uh, uh, Society, where she served as the uh, uh, research staff on, on research expert on the uh, on the on the community. So we would like to, and she wrote on on, on Depok and has published several books and articles on the topics. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Tri Wahyuning to present uh, her uh, paper. Uh, you have fifteen minutes, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Padias and uh, the audience. I will tell. I will to tell. I try to tell in brief how the how the Belanda Depok is in is form, a uh, lifestyle, and the end history about uh, Belanda Depok in revolution and when the uh, private land ends. Okay, I try to share my PPT. Okay. Uh, Land Depok is located between Jakarta and Bogor. Jakarta and Bogor are too closely related to the center of governmental activities, a colonial and national regime. In both cities, there are places of governor general and then of president Indonesian Republic. Private land of Depok was an area for living of the Depokers community, which they often called Belanda Depok. They also called Mardikers, on an orang depok asli. In term of orang depok asli is used by some researchers for different differentiating into villager and uh, orang depok asal and betawi oral peoples who live in around depok for a long times. Kakak mana? Awah mana? Sebentar, uh, saya ada gangguan untuk menginikan uh, menginikan uh, mengoperasikannya. Ini nggak bisa diklik. Hmm, kalau nomor dua ini, yang ini, hmm, 
Una patata, ok. I'm sorry. Belanda Depok was a prime social group of community and Depok. They different from another group. Their distinctive character which was their loyalty, loyalty toward the Dutch regime and colon, colonial. Their colonial loyalty had a special influence on their revolution relation with another social, especially with the native. Erotic, ironically, geopolitical location had a majority of natives, especially Muslim in as Betawi with some different social character, socially, cultural, and politically. Kan nggak bisa lagi? Dipencet aja, Bu. Mau saya ke tengah, mau saya ke tengah. Ke layarnya, layarnya diklik. Dah, geser lagi coba. Belanda Depok descended from the social group that mm. established by Cornelis Castellan, who bought a complex of land on May 1899 from Lucas Mayer, resident of Cirebon. Since their early existence, they were made into a different group to work legally, socially, and economically to their priority status. Christianity as a spiritual was why uh, of life made them of preliminary, preliminary religious group who live in Batavia hinterland. In colonial social structure, Christian had a special role in education and educo, educational facilities from the government. Because of social lifestyle and process, the Dutch group made a part social group in the community. It was caused not only by the religious factor, but also by the her, the her social role and colonial social system. They were superior into a majority of native people as inferior. It was made worse by the colonial discriminatory police as land renter. For example, the Muslim native majority had to pay their 20% for manual. The Dutch Depok had to pay only 10%. The condition triggered a social tension in the community. The Dutch colonial regime capitulated to the Japanese army on March 9 and began at a period of military domination. The Japanese military regime tried to mobilize a majority of natives for a support to the regime's war. The military regime banned the Dutch social symbol as opposant in included Dutch language, Western culture, and also Christianity as a social group. The special status of colonial collapse and turned into the treated start eye of the military regime. Japanese occupation troop captured and captivate all Christian and missionaries. It abolished, it abolished the social symbol of colonial protector for the Belanda Depok. The occupation troop also took over public facilities as railway, governmental office, health facilities, and so on. And her policy, the regime did not make a great social structure, especially social life of the Belanda Depok, export, except remove their colonial protection. The Japanese capitulation to Allied force was used by by in revolution power to proclaim their independence on 17 August. 
the revolutionary group suspected that the Dutch colonial regime return and take over the colony. It caused a condition with a high intensity of conflict. The Blanda Depot was a target of hatred and suspicion in the conflict situation because of their colonial identities. The tense situation culminated is an action of Gedoran. All Christian facilities as a colonial symbol were the violence, looting, rent, and vandalism. Among the captives, women and children were spread isolated into the Hementa building with hot food and good shop. The men were hurt to play down. Johanna Laurentia Lauren is a former teacher of Depok, was a former student member of TKR. After the situation, situation was formal, normal, some people of Blanda Depok tried to, to, to go to, ho to house, finding their badly damaged house, they leave Depok for the areas under Nika. The situation returned to be normal in the middle of 1947 with the bustling, not all of the people returned to their home. The school and the Christian church function normally send the time renovation. They celebrate again all religious Christmas and social holiday, Castellan joyfulness. After the transfer of sovereignty in December 1949, Indonesia was a national social structure was established with national symbol. One of symbol was a national identity that proposed to the Belanda Depok to Indonesian people. A new challenge, they have a choose a new identity status of citizen Indonesian or Dutch. They had followed the new regime included in the own system. Namely, they had to give up their private land with our facilities, colonial heritage to the Indonesian government and change into the national governance as a citizen in 1952. The challenge became even greater when there was a change in the status of the right of control and owner of Depok's private land in 1942, which marked the end of Depok's private land. An epilogue, as a result of traumatic psychology under the revolution, in the Belanda Depok's community was divided into two social. Most of them choose to stay in Depok as their ascent as their ancestor heritage as an Indonesian citizen, and another choose to leave the book for Netherlands follow the colonization and try to make a new life there as the citizen, Netherlands citizen. Thank you, Padias. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Titi. <clears throat> I think the Depok, Depok community really represent this very unique uh, community where we talk about uh, the Dutch or the Dutch uh, Indies, the Indos, more in general term, while in Depok, we could basically talk about a community with that particular identity and the independence, the so-called uh, Gedoran, the, the violent, that, uh, a violent event that was also alluded by Abdul Wahid earlier. And what happened with the community after that, it's really a fascinating uh, study by uh, Ibu Titi. And I think uh, we can uh, ask more later on during the question and answer. But before that, I would like to ask uh, Jos Bisono to present uh, his uh, paper. Uh, I know uh, Jos from many years ago in Amsterdam uh, when he was still working at the uh, World Ombro in in Hilversum, and but he has great interest in uh, critical studies of development and history. And after uh, now, he's, uh, he, he, he writes, he has published several books on Indonesian history, uh, which already out of print and uh, hardly seek. So uh, it would be great to hear more 
of uh, the uh, on the Indonesian Revolution through the uh, literature. Uh, please, uh, uh, Yos Bibisono, uh, I have 15 minutes. Okay. I some, somehow I need to see somebody. Okay, somebody can help me with uh, my presentation. Uh, I need actually I need the uh, the the not the Indonesian version but the English version. Have you got the English version? Uh, do do please use the English version, not not the not the uh, Indonesian version. I've submit, submitted two uh, two uh, two versions. Uh, Indonesian and and English, but somehow I not, for now I need the uh, English person to be uh, uh, presented. Is that possible? <laughs> so can somebody? Uh, this is the so this is the, person, this, yeah? is the uh, this is the yeah. Indonesian person, but I need the the English person. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's running this, but could you <laughs> change to the English version? Uh, maybe. Is it possible? Or, or okay, then I I I can just say that um um when when the. Japanese occupation started in 1940, in March 1942. Um, it marked also the end of everything Dutch in Indonesia. So no Dutch colonial government, they fled to, to Australia. No Dutch media, uh, newspapers, magazines, and radio. No Dutch schools and no Dutch language. Uh, uh, is it possible to, th this is, um, I've, I've now uh, there is a slide on the end of Nirom. Nirom is the Dutch uh, radio, whereas they say you know farewell, farewell, uh, they bid farewell and uh, until the better times. That's the next slide. Yes, please play that slide. Is it possible to hear the, the, the sound? Luid en luisteraars. Hier is de Nierom de Bandoen. Wij gaan nu sluit en luisteraars. Vaarwel tot betere tijd. Leven het vaderland, leven de koningin. Yes, that's the, that's the the first uh, line of the Dutch national anthem, which uh, closes the uh, the uh, the broadcast of uh, Nirom. And and then uh, in uh, when if everything this Dutch disappeared, then Indonesian language by Indonesia appeared in the public life. So there is uh, in the Dutch colonial uh, in the Dutch time during the Dutch colonial time, there is some kind of backwardness in the Indonesian language. Those who had good command in Dutch always spoke it. Yes, no. <laughs> That's that's the next uh, the the next slide if it's possible. Yes. Oh, the next no, not this one. The next one, after this. After this, after this, please. Can you do the next slide? Yes. So uh, Indonesian, uh, the Indonesian language has been uh, uh, used in the public life. Before that, during the, uh, the Dutch colonial time, there is, there is a sense of backwardness in the Indonesian language. Those who has good command of Dutch 
always spoke it, and so the national language was barely used. And the discussion during the Dutch time of intellectual, cultural, and political matters were always conducted in Dutch. But suddenly, it all disappeared. Indonesian language was encouraged. People used the language more frequently. The next, the next slide, please. Yes. And so now, now we, we, we uh, go, uh, we step to the uh, something uh, <coughs> about literature as, as how, how far this uh, affects the, 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 the literature. And we can say that uh, during, the, during the Japanese occupation, there is this also the end of the Dutch, old Dutch literary habit. Uh, all those, all those uh, fiction, be it novels or short stories during the Dutch colonial time, has always uh, has the contradiction between tradition and modernity, as of course propagated by Balai Pustaka, that's Institute for Folks Lecture in, in Dutch, the Dutch publishing house. And after Balai Pustaka, there is this Angkatan Punjanga Baru. We also dream about uh, the modern Indonesian or Indonesian nationalism in the literature, in the cultural life, what will be, um, what will be the, uh, the, the kind of literature in, in Indonesia when it's, uh, when it's, uh, when Indonesia has become independent. And so um, the Indonesian writers found themselves out in the open. That they always have this control, like you know, uh, modern and and uh, tradition and and, and uh, 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 modern Indonesian Indonesian nationalism in the culture, but in in cultural life in the literature. But now everything is gone, and so they have they are found out in the open. And what are they going to write about Indonesia? So it now appears the Angkatan 45 or uh, generation of 1945. What, who are they? This is, are we on the next uh, slide? Who are they, Angkatan 45? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yes. Who are they? They are writers, they were writers who born shortly after 1942, around 25 writers. And only, f um, most of them are male writers, only four are female. They were confronted by the fact that Indonesia was proclaimed as an independent state on August, uh, 17 August, 1945. Their writings concentrates, concentrated mostly around this Big Bang of uh, 17 August 1945. They revolutionized the Indonesian literary tradition, both poetry and prose. And there are two uh, important figures in Angkatan, in generation of 45, in Angkatan Balima, which are Khairil Anwar and poetry and Idrus in uh, prose. Uh, the next slide, please. Khadil Anwar. Um, he, no, he, he, lives between, he lived between 1942 and 1949, and 1922 and 1949, so he died uh, at the age of 27. He is the most famous Indonesian poet. He renewed the tradition of poetry because before that uh, we have, uh, Indonesian have like the pantuns, you know, all this uh, with, with rhythm. And, and also we have uh, the, 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 from the, from the Dutch tradition, from the Dutch like sonnets, but he got rid of, of them. They got it both of the, uh, 
of the tradition uh, uh, poetry, uh, tradi uh, traditional poetry, which is Pantun. He also got rid of sonnets, and then he made his own free poetry. Uh, Khairil is very infant. He used very influential language. Modern Indonesian is Khairil's language. He wrote about 70 poems, mostly about the 1945 revolution. He was a Muslim, but wrote poem about Jesus on the cross. So this is something um, uh, very special as, as perhaps we, uh, we should also uh, say it out loud uh, today. And, uh, Although there is no Dutch uh, tradition, no Dutch, uh, uh, no Dutch language, everything Dutch was gone, but we have still have to, to note that at least he was influenced by two Dutch poets, which is Hendrik Marsman and Jan Jakob Slauerhof. Uh, let's uh, proceed to the next uh, slide, which is Kharil Anwar. Uh, this is this 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 is how he looks like, and this Isa is his, is his poem about uh, Jesus on the cross, uh, and then Karawang Bekasi, the, the other famous one, is about 1945 and those uh, the revolution and those who died in the during the revolution. Uh, the next slide. is his famous poem, Aku. Uh, but this is uh, actually uh, in, in, you can see this in Leiden. No, no, nowhere I think is Kharil uh, 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 work being uh, written, I mean, being shown uh, in, in public like, in, like this in Leiden. So we can see that, uh, we can read it. And every, I think if every Indonesian, uh, uh, school children uh, in high school, they have to memorize Aku eh? still. Let's uh, proceed to the next uh, slide, which is Idrus. It's, it, talks, it, will, it, it talks about Idrus. Idrus, uh, uh, he lived from 1921 until 1979. Uh, he is called as the Khairil Anwar of the prose. That's what they always say. And he always emphasized the harsh and unforgiving reality of daily life. His writing is full of cynicism and sarcasm. He mixed fiction and nonfiction in order to give a complete picture of the revolutionary situation of Indonesia. He was the first author to fictionalize the 1945 revolution. Even his uh, story Surabaya, we are not in Surabaya, we are, we are not connecting with Surabaya, described the, blood, the bloodbath in November 1945 in the East Javanese city. Idrus used the term Gedoran to describe violence against Indonesian. What happened in so Gedoran um, is all, all, already mentioned in in the previous uh, in the previous present present uh, presentations. Um, then let's move to the next uh, slide, which is Idrus. Do we see Idrus now? Yes, this is Idrus. And that's his, his uh, uh, collection of, so, sorry, very, very, actually very, very tiny book. And, and he, in, 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 number, uh, in page 45, he used the, 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 the word menggedorkah dia, which is, of course, uh, uh, we have a gedoran. So this is Idrus um, with Surabaya. It's actually unclear whether he was in Surabaya or not uh, in 1945. But it's this uh, Surabaya, this uh, collection of stories was published in 1948. So 
three years later, and still used the uh, the old Dutch uh, van Ophuysen spelling, as you can read uh, in the next uh, in, in, in the next page. Um, what I want to say is that this is a mixture between um, uh, fiction and nonfiction. And on the part of the nonfiction story, we can also see how the, uh, the ideals of Indonesian uh, of Indonesia in the future. He, for instance, he condemned militarism. What, and then we, he said that uh, I should have uh, I should have taken it as a as 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 a as a quote. But anyway, there is a uh, a passage in Surabaya where Idrus condemned uh, militarism, and we should have. Um, uh, uh, civilian government and and military should uh, should be under the civilian government. Government. That's what uh, that, that's, that's the ideal of a of a revolution. Okay, let's uh, proceed to the sec to the next page. And now I'm going. I'm discussing about something which is rare in Indonesia under uh, Orde Baru under Suharto. Left and right in the in the Indonesian literature, you know, um, after the revolution, in it, uh, what come out after the revolution is a complete Indonesia, Indonesia which has left and right wing. You see, but Suharta made it on uh, uh, got rid of the left wing, and so we, Indonesia has only now has only right wing. But left and right in the Indonesian literature. Uh, there is a public debate between uh, writers. Um, uh, they were actually trying to discover Indonesian identity. What is Indonesian identity? And they're trying to give shape to the ideal of the revolution and to determine the Indonesian place in the world, modern world. So there are two ways to uh, two streams in in the literary world at that time uh, the, the the one who called uh, the the lekra the left side which is they, they engage in the, the, the so-called large anga large which means uh 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 art which is sided uh, uh, art with two sides seni yang memiha seni yang memiha that's that's what uh, the uh, important uh, principle of Lekra. And the other one, Manikabu, actually Manikabu was set up by the military. It's Lach Pulach, uh, uh, art only for art, which the proponent is Mokhtar Lubis. The next uh, slide, please. Yes, this is Pramude Anantatur. His first novel, I mean, he published firstly, like most of Indonesian authors, published a, a collection of short stories. But his novel, there are two of his early novels, Perburuan and Keluarga Guerrilla. It should actually, it should, it, perhaps the better it was Keluarga Guerrilla first and Perburuan later. But the, he wrote these uh, two novels uh, when he was in prison. And this is about, um, about the, uh, uh, in, of course, about the fight of independence. Keraga Guerrilla is very sad because the whole family perished uh, because of the revolution. Uh, but in uh, Perburuan, there is uh, some kind. There is a um, a very good uh, uh, description of the situation uh, during the revolution, in which a, 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 a son or, or no two sons had to uh, um, murder uh, the father in order uh, not to be discovered both by uh, J Japan man and by the, the Dutch after uh, J Japan has gone. So yeah, this is a very, um, very dilemmatic situation which, which Pramudya successfully described in his uh, Parburuan uh, novel. And of course, um, uh, uh, as somebody from Lekra, he always uh, tried to portray uh, uh, people from, uh, you know, the lower the lower caste of the society. That's that's you know that's somebody like uh, Pramudia. 
Uh, and now we uh, proceed to this, the other author, which is uh, Mokhtar Lubis. Uh, yes, you have only one minute left. Yes, Mokhtar Lubis. Um, he wrote two novels. Uh, this, these are two first uh, of uh, his novels. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then we have uh, the other authors, to, to the next slide, other authors who uh, all has the, all the theme of 1945 revolution, Mangan Vijaya. Uh, can we proceed to the next? Uh, yes, Mangan Vijaya. And then also he, he wrote this, this novel, Burung Burung Manyar. Uh, it's also about 1945 revolution. And then the next one uh, is Iksakabanu. He was born in 1962. And there is a collection of stories of his uh, in which uh, one uh, story tells about the violence against the Dutch uh, it's, uh, during the revolution. And then the last one is uh, Eka Kurniawan, he wrote Cantik untuk uh, Cantik uh, Itu Luka. It also has a colonial uh, elements in it. So my conclusion is, which is in the next chapter, um, revol uh, 1945 revolution is very important to, extremely important to Indonesian literature. And the 1945 generations revolutionized Indonesian literary world. They sparked a lively discussion, especially between left and right wing writers. But no such discussions by recent writers. So there is no such discussion about left and right. Now they just write on the theme. So that's my presentation, Diaz. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Bayas uh, Vipisono. I think there are two uh, main uh, points that I'm really uh, interested in your presentation. One is that this reappearance uh, of reappearing of Indonesian Indonesian language after the uh, the, the, the banning of uh, Dutch language materials. So it's kind of parallel with what uh, Ibu Erwisa led, uh, earlier present presenting about the. The, the, the appearance of uh, Indonesian uh, 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 white collar workers because of this lack of color. So there is this upgrading of Indonesian into position which would not, they would not occupy otherwise if it had the, uh, the Japanese occupation uh, didn't happen. So that's, that's one thing. Yet at the same time, as you pointed out, um, this uh, appearance also uh, makes some things disappear, like a discussion on, on the debate on uh, modernity and, and, and tradition. Um, also, highlight you highlighted uh, what, what maybe we can call now like casualties of revolution, all this, the, the Cluarga Grilla and uh, the, the, the pool that become casualty of, of, of revolution. Something maybe uh, Ibu Titi in the pop could also relate. Uh, so we have time now for question, question and answer. We have uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, for this session. So if you have, if you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, raise hands and uh, we will unmute you, uh, assuming that I can unmute myself. Okay, uh, Brett, one, uh, please, pa. Let's see. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, uh, Joss, a wonderful presentation. Um, I wonder whether we can um, kind of sew together <laughs> yesterday's um, uh, Dutch panel and today. And um, see, I'm just curious what you think about the possibility of sewing the Japanese occupation period in as a period in which the literature that is being written, mostly short literature um, or poetry, is politically engaged in, in trying to ch change and shape society uh, in a way that is perhaps different than what develops in Lekra, 
but preceding it. And so it might kind of stick, connect up to the earlier uh, PKI literature in the 1920s. And that we might be able to see a stream of developing political engagement, which in the Japanese occupation, a division between two would be impossible. It has mm. to be together into one and only mm. breaks apart then in the during and after the revolution. Is that a possible vision or how do you see it? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been that far and in looking into you know, the, the 1920s, but, um, and also, uh, I'm 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 a bit in in dubio about uh, div, uh, uh, putting either Khairil or Idris on on left and right because you know the situation was that everybody was engaged in the politics at that time Khairil was engaged in the politics and also Idris but then they were busy with uh, describing the situation not really well. Idris did about, you know, saying that Indonesian should be governed by civilian and not military. But I'm not, I'm, 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 a bit, I'm sure about, you know, whether this is a left or right uh, uh, situation, because he was just writing about what people was thinking about it. And um, of course, then afterwards it's, it's left and right. But when it burst, when it bursted the revolution, it was, perceived by both left and right writers as more um, of a uh, so something they they you know they 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 accept it with both hands and that makes it difficult to and also I think the discussion about left and right is actually more on uh, the ideological side it was it's not real, really reflected on the literary products of those discussions. I don't think, um, perhaps this is what deviates uh, from the 1920s, is that even, even though Pramudia wrote about Keluarga Guerrilla or Perburuan, I don't think it is that much different from uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, 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 Mokhtar Lubis. You see, it, I don't think the, the product is, is not that different, but uh, their discussion was more about ideology about the future of Indonesia. And that I think should be recognized now because th that's, that's, the, the, that's the time when Indonesia was still complete. Indonesia has its left and right wing and it should be uh, acknowledged and it should be you know, appreciated. And um, not only saying that, you know, um, I mean, the discussion about, about the future of Indonesia at that time was very lively, but um, it's not really reflected on the literary product. That's perhaps, perhaps my answer, but I don't think, I mean, to connect it with, with the 1920s, it, it's, I, I will need another research. But, but uh, then con connecting to the wartime period is easier? It is easier, yes, because Nin it's uh, 1942 to 45. Yes, it is easier because it's the time when uh, Indonesian language uh, appeared in the public, and so uh, I mean, it's what what made made, made it different with 19, uh, you know, the, during the Dutch time because it's the time when even in 1938, uh, we, because actually formally. In the Volksrat, in the in in the Dutch Parliament, in the in the Parliament during the Dutch time, uh, people are allowed to use both languages in uh, Malay, Indonesian, and Dutch. But most of most of them they, they still use Dutch because it's difficult to uh, express ones in a in a complicated situation like politics with in in Malay, which is still very very rudimentary. There is no enough vocabulary, for instance, to to express your political ideas. So, um, what should I say? <laughs> um, when it when 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 the Dutch gone, when the Dutch are gone, uh, there is this uh, uh, urgency, urge to use Indonesian, and so the the, the language. Uh, 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 become lively and 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 it, 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 it become a an habit and you not only in speaking but also in reading. So um, okay. and it's, it, that's a very good 
start actually for the uh, uh, generasi 45 angkatan 45 generation of 45 to you know to 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 have the literary product it's it's different from uh, I, mean, I mean you, you can immediately see that you know uh, there is a product uh, the literary product of 45 or 1920 you can immediately see it because the language is different yeah. so yeah. I would like to ask, uh, invite Pa Dawam Sabri. Maybe he has question related to this. Then we can continue the discussion. Pa Dawam Sabri. Uh, yeah, silakan, please. Oh, okay. I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Triwah Yuning. Si. No. Triwah Yuning, uh, talking about the popular religious activity during uh, Japanese occupation. Maybe such as celebrate Christmas or do worship. I think they really got discrimination, even forbidden to do it. And I would like to ask you, because I really curious about condition from Indonesian Christian perspective. Is that discrimination just for the pop Belanda or for all of Christian, including Indonesian Christian? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a, a different, but I would invite Ibu Titi, Ibu Tri, Wahyuning. Are you still with us? Uh, uh. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the Christianity, Christianity, which was inherited as the only spiritual way of life for Jamaat. Uh, for Belanda Depok, uh, made from the first Christian Bumi Putra community living in the interior of Batavia and from London. Uh, and uh, uh, Belanda Depok is not uh, the Dutch, but Belanda Depok is an Indonesian uh, people. Uh, who is a uh, uh, slave for, uh, from the Cornelis Castellan. Yeah. There is a second question, uh, Ibu Titi whether the discrimination was only for the Dutch depot or for Christian in general? Uh, no, no. Uh, Belanda depot and the uh, 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 Pribumi. There is- uh, No, for the, the practicing, of, uh, uh, practicing of Christian uh, religion. Is yeah. the discrimination only, or is also for other- Yeah, yeah, depot? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe Pak Sarkawi wants to follow up on that. Thank you, Pak Dias. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a little bit about the Bu Titi presentation about the... Yeah. I think this is an interesting topic. So my question is, uh, I, I, want to, I want to know more about the Belanda Depot after the revolution era. So most of them move to Holland or Lenderans on still yeah. a depot, Butiti. Uh, some of uh, them uh, go to the uh, Netherlands and uh, some of them and, and uh, 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 became an uh, Indonesian uh, citizen. There is a divided uh, 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 split, split identity uh, of uh, Belanda Depok. Hmm. Hello? Yeah. Butiti? Yeah, itu barangkali no. Pak. Yeah, it, it may be, uh, that is okay. maybe uh, about my answer. Okay, uh, thank you, Bhutiti. 
Uh, Pak Yos, there are two questions that uh, is directed to you, Pak Yos. And I think there are parallels in this question. Is the, maybe I can enlarge the, the questions a little bit by if there is this discussion on the future of Indonesia, what will be the, uh, the, the, the role of the quote unquote uh, foreign, ele uh, foreign elements, if you like, or foreign, foreignness? as in languages or in other stuff, because uh, question of Daya, from Daya Wijaya also talking about the influence of foreign words and the question of Wildan Nanda also raised the issue of the influence of uh, Arabic or Chinese uh, literature in Indonesian uh, literature of that time. Um, maybe if I yes, could respond to that. Mm. Um, um, uh, okay, so uh, for Daya, uh, the, the word Gedoran is not is not uh, is not a foreign word. Is it actually it's a Japanese word? Uh, and it, it to to uh, describe the violence against uh, Indonesian. So um, this is very important now in the Netherlands because they were talking about about uh, bersiap, which is not Indonesian word. Big, uh, Indonesian word is bersiap siap, siap or siap siaga, not bersiap. Bersiap is not Indonesian word. Um, it's a, it's a, in, in fact, it's a Dutch word. But we in Indonesia, we have gedoran, ngeli, uh, uh, and, and I, I think one more word which describes the, the violence against Indonesian at that time. And viol so violence is not only against, uh, against uh, uh, the, the Dutch or Eura Eurasian, but also against the, uh, Indonesian at that time. That's gedoran. Um, uh, there is a yeah for for Wilda Nanda. I'm I'm not sure uh, during the yeah okay. So this is uh, about uh, about literature. Well, the Dutch has been actually has been fighting against uh, the Chinese uh, uh, because the Chinese dominate uh, the uh, the printing world in Indonesia, and so they they, they want to get rid of the, the Chinese by by at least. Uh, uh using uh, by establishing the uh uh by establishing the uh sorry the the no not by 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 proclaiming the uh the the, the van Ophuysen, uh van Ophuysen, uh spelling first and then second time by uh by uh uh using by establishing the uh, for lecture of uh, Balai Pustaka, that's the the way to get rid of the uh, big what say they they perceived as big Chinese influence in the in the in in the literary world and also in the printing world, and uh, uh, from uh, Andi Suwirta about. Um, <laughs> uh, you know whether. Uh, writers are separated from or, uh, politics uh, and I did as uh, well this is Ordobaru thinking is, uh, to, uh, sorry to say that at that time even writers has a, its political uh, a meaning and also political political understanding and how the society should work and also uh, how they should produce their uh, literary work so uh, there is no big. There is no separation between literature, politics, or economics. Everything is one. This is one society. Thinking it as separate entities is the way uh, how Ordobaru works. Because people does or they, they don't want people to think about politics. If, if you are active in literature, think about literature. No politics. That's that's Ordobaru. So we should get rid of that. Ordobaru has gone for almost twenty five years now. But why should we still? you know, uh, perceive their, their way of thinking. No, there is no such things. It's always like, you know, uh, we, we always think about politics, politics and society, everything is one. So no, no separation. And uh, uh, yeah, I think, I hope I answered the, the questions that are addressed to me. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we also uh, are running out of time. The schedule is that we should, uh, the, the one that was given to me, we should have a, a, a 45 minute break before we start again at 6 p.m. in Western Indonesian time. Uh, but we still have to uh, 
presenter after that, uh, which was uh, Ibu Murdiati and Pak Ron Habibu. Um, so, um, uh, what, should, should we follow the, the schedule? Pak uh, Sarkawi or Ibu Murdiati, should we revise the schedule or should we stick with that? Uh, maybe the, the organizer can. If not, then we could just take this 20 minutes. You know, we can take a break until 6 p.m. and then we start again at that 6 p.m. Western Indonesian time. Okay, uh, if that's the case, then thank you very much for the presentation of Ibu Titi and Pa Yos Bibisono. Uh, those two uh, important papers, again, uh, uh, pointing out to all those forgotten groups and uh, communities that uh, kind of uh, being hidden in this uh, uh, revolution uh, era. So uh, please give big applause to those two presenters and uh, we will see each other again in 40 minutes. Is that good? Okay. Thank you.
it's uh, and it's a movie or the group. Hello, but yes, your sound is not uh, stable. Hello, but yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we have last session with two present. Uh, sorry, Pak Dias. Hello, Pak Dias. Yes. Putus-putus, Pak, Uh, apa sekarang lebih kedengaran suara saya? Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, baik. Uh, thank you. We will continue with uh, the next uh, session. We will have two presentation. One from Ms. Murdiati and the next one will be from uh, Mr. Ron Habibu. Uh, Ms. Murdiati is a senior lecturer at the Department of History at Universitas Erlangga. She graduated from Gajah Mada University and now she's focusing more on uh, women's history and gender perspective in history. I hope I, uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me on that. Uh, uh, Ms. Murdiati, please, uh, you have 15 minutes to present your uh, presentation, your paper. Okay, thank you, uh, Pak Dias, uh, for your uh, time for me. Uh, but, Pak, uh, uh, Forgive me if uh, maybe that what I wish I say will be very short uh, because this is my uh, preliminary research. Uh, my okay, uh, that's my main topic. Uh, Woman and resisting Indonesian um, uh, It seems like there is uh, another gadget within your area. Maybe that should be okay. Uh, turn off. Okay, thank yeah, you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that's my topic uh, about women and disease in Indonesian revolutions. Uh, but uh, we know uh, we take upon the resilience women in revolution spirits. That's, uh, that's many uh, reason for me. Uh, why women? Because women have not been seen or talked uh, much in some research on the revolution, especially when we uh, connected in uh, disease uh, issues. So uh, secondly, in many existing resources, most of them uh, mainly women only narrated to be play in the back line, such like Indonesia, Red Cross or PME or public kitchen. So uh, some written sources don't tell much about what actually happened and experienced by many women. So like, for example, how is the conditions of women when they become refugees or life in refugees? 
Even though from a lot of evidence, especially interview evidence, many women experience while they were in refusal camps, such like if we see about our uh, sources when I uh, went to many women in Surabaya, exactly in Ibuha, 80, 90 years old, thought how the situation was when she had to leave Surabaya, Surabaya and take refuge in Sidoarjo. Ibuha was very well established background while still still living in Surabaya. So if uh, I would like I would like retell about Ibuha, Ibuha is uh, Ibuha was a uh, uh, members of parliament in Surabaya. But Ibuha has to evacuate it in a situation that was no longer the same as before with the conditions in the refuse camp. That, that Ibuha must be able to survive, including when her child dies in the refugia due to illness, malaria, typhus, and dysentery. So the, my second uh, uh, my second Ibu T, 84, 85 years, she has a background as radio announcer, RRI in Surabaya, in during Japanese period and fled to Mojokerto when the war broke out in Surabaya. Besides, she lost his job. During the evacuation, she had suffered from tipus and HO, Hongadorum. So in the third, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my sources, Ibu L, I mentioned Ibu L, 80, uh, 82 years. She was a Tionghoa or Chinese woman she told that she briefly fled, but she returned to Surabaya again because she was she was the only one who fled from his family, and she was the uh, luckiest because his older sisters was taken by Japanese. Ibu L lived in Surabaya from Bubenik Plat. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our sources too uh, from two novels. Uh, from uh, Suparto Prata, Mencari Sarang Angin, and Saksi Mata. The first novel, Mencari Sarang Angin, thought uh, about the situations woman in a uh, revolution background. And Saksi Mata uh, thought about the woman in a Japanese period. But in this case, in these two novels, not a uh, above but when the same author actually talk a lot of women in the Japanese era and revolutions but again it doesn't much mention about disease that money suffer from in the refuse camp so uh, that's uh, that's my uh, little presentations thank you uh, pa Diaz. Uh, Ibu Mur, are yeah. you are you finished with that? Yeah, finished my finish. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I have to do have to recharge my gadgets. I, I missed that one. Okay. Um, the next presenter will be uh, Mr. Ron Habibu. He wrote uh, extensively on the Malukas, uh, the, the Malukas descent in on the Netherlands and also the history of Maluku, and he has published several books on that topics and he will uh, be presenting also on the Malukus, the Malukans in the Indonesian revolution. I give you the floor, uh, Ron Habibu, please. Thank you, Padias. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, the organization for giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, one of, in my opinion at least, uh, one of the forgotten groups and that's um, Malukans. Uh, contrary to the title mentioned, I would like to add a somewhat broader scope 
and uh, give my speech about um, Moluccans and Dutch colonial interests during the Second World War and the decolonization of Indonesia. And having said that, I almost uh, forgot in my mind, uh, at least, uh, to mention that today there are about uh, 75,000 Moluccans living in the Netherlands, and most of them are descendants of the Knil soldiers, Marines, and their families, who in 1951 were transported to the Netherlands for a temporary stay. Okay, well, uh, for a long time, the role of Moluccans during the Second World War and the decolonization of Indonesia until 49 has been described in the Netherlands as part of a Dutch shared history and from a European perspective. The story of the role of Moluccans in this regard can be viewed from three angles. First, stories told by the Dutch non-Moluccans about Moluccans, the so-called European perspective. Stories told by Moluccans, Moluccan perspective. And uh, thirdly, stories told by Dutch and Moluccans, a combined perspective. Well, of course, each of these angles has its pros and cons. And in search of a general nuanced uh, picture of the role of Moluccans, it's important, where possible, to opt for a combination of all perspectives. For the Moluccan community, it's important that every group also recognize their own Moluccan perspective in the story. I would like to dwell on the three approaches mentioned. First of all, the European perspective. I already mentioned the European approach to the role of Moluccans during the years uh, 1942 until 1949 at the outset. A striking example of this can be found in the academic standard work on the Kingdom of the Netherlands during the Second World War by Dr. Lou de Jong. Here, the well-known Dutch historian talks about the so-called Haga conspiracy, a movement that organized resistance in Banjarmasin in Kalimantan against the Japanese occupiers. Within this group, a so-called Ambonese midwife played an important role as a courier between Banjarmasin and Surabaya on Java. She was arrested by the Japanese authorities and died in captivity in December 1943. From a European perspective, this mentioning of an Ammonist midwife uh, seems sufficient. Dutch resistance against the Japanese occupiers was supported by an Ammonist midwife. However, from a Moluccan perspective, this is completely insufficient. Uh, the identification is far too vague because who was this Ammonist midwife? What was her name? Did she have a family? And what was she doing in Bajamasen and what was her role? Another example of an explicitly European perspective uh, is the description of a case in Pamantang Siantar on Sumatra on October 15, 1945, so during the so-called Bersia period. Because of the limited time, I will give a short version of the event. There was a rumor that in front of a hotel in Medan, a Dutch soldier had ripped off the little red white flag from a child's uniform and stepped on it. This rumor also reached Siantar. As a result, a large crowd gathered in front of the Siantar hotel and eventually attacked the hotel. Room by room was broken into and the guests were chin chunked, chopped dead. Then came the looting. The entire hotel was eventually burned down and the Swiss owner, some guests, two Dutch soldiers and a few dozen Ammonese and Manadonese soldiers who had been released from Japanese imprisonment and were awaiting transport to Medan in a few houses around the hotel were murdered. Well, the name of the European victims were known and mentioned in the media. However, at least 20 people were killed among the Ammonese and Manadonese but their names are not mentioned. This seems typical for European perspective. Finally, the European perspective on the role of Moluccans is also apparent from the fact that during the Second World War and the Indonesian War of Independence, Moluccans are only mentioned in Dutch sources if they support the story and perspective in a supporting role. After this uh, European Perspective, I would like to address the Moluccan and combined European Moluccan perspectives. 
There are no books by Moluccans who have researched and described the entire Dutch Moluccan story during the Second World War and the decolonization of Indonesia. A story in which Moluccans are leading and others play a supporting role. There are only a few works in which the Moluccan voice is heard, albeit fragments and limited, about events during the war. Actually, it was only from the 1970s that the Moluccan story played a more central role in literature and research, at least in the Netherlands. After the Netherlands was abruptly awakened in the 1970s by violent hostage actions by Moluccan youth, publications appeared in, in, in the Netherlands. In some of these publications, Moluccans in the Netherlands of the first generation tell about their time and experiences during the wars in Indonesia. This presentation approaches the Moluccan perspective of Moluccans who choose the Dutch side during the years 42-49. To this day, a Dutch colonial perspective still dominates the Moluccan community in the Netherlands. The story of Moluccans who sided with the Indonesian nationalists is virtually unknown. Nevertheless, this has already been pointed out in the Netherlands by the Dutch journalist Ben van Kaam with his work called Ambon Through the Ages, dates from uh, 1977. A written reproduction of a television documentary, which also gives floor to Moluccans who do not reflect Dutch colonial interests, but on the contrary, oppose Dutch colonial rule. In recent studies, the Moluccan voice is increasingly discussed. Moluccan voices are heard more often so that the part of the, Mol <clears throat> sorry, the Moluccan story, the Moluccan perspective is brought forward. But there is still no Moluccan story about the Second World War and the Indonesian War of Independence. Well, what about this Moluccan story? The story of the role of Moluccans uh, on the Dutch side is based on a number of questions. Which Moluccans played where, when, and what role during the Second World War and the decolonization of Indonesia? In both the ego documents of Dutch veterans and in the debates about war crimes, it's striking how often veterans of the Dutch army refer to Knil soldiers as the perpetrators of the violence. There are many references to dark colored subordinate Knil sergeants and corporals who did the dirty work for the Dutch. This often implicitly refers to Moluccas, Moluccans. Recent research concludes that there is no convincing evidence to support or to reject the hypothesis that Moluccans were extremely involved in extreme violence. And on the other hand, there are also numerous stories of Dutch and Eurasians who are grateful to the Moluccans for saving their lives during the Bersia period. For further research into the testimonies of Moluccan soldiers, it's important to distinguish Moluccan Knil soldiers who entered service before the Second World War, the so-called Soldatutua, the old soldiers, and those who entered the Knil after the Japanese capitulation in 45, the so-called Sadaru Muda, the young soldiers. Malakans were almost by definition regarded by the Japanese occupiers as closely linked to the Dutch colonial authority. The Sodaru Tua therefore often endured torture and other ill treatment by the Japanese soldiers during the occupation, Japanese occupation. And it's clear that they are traumatized as a result. For that reason, they are likely to have been generally tougher and perhaps more cruel than the Soldado Muda during the Indonesian War of Independence. During the Bersia period, Indonesian nationalists also often regarded Moluccans as black Dutchmen or as often was said in Java, Londo, Londo, Iren. During the research research project, Independence, Decolonization, Violence and War in Indonesia, 1945-1950, I was able to make a modest contribution to the inventory and identification of victims during the so-called Bersia period. Previously, I have conducted a study into the identification of victims on the Dutch side during the Second World War in the Dutch East Indies. 
although the total number of victims can never be stated exactly, there's a so-called lower limit, the minimum number of victims. During the Second World War, there were approximately 20,200 registers, registered casualties on the Dutch side. And around 8,200 victims of the CNIL and the Dutch Navy and 12,000 civilians. And of this number, at least 6,500 are indigenous victims. And more than half of these indigenous victims were Moluccans, 2,100. Uh, um, 2, and Manadunis, 1,200. During the Bersia period, the number of confirmed and registered victims on the Dutch side is 3,723 uh, victims. By large, the largest uh, part of the deaths have occurred on Java and Sumatra. Most victims were Europeans, including Eurasians, namely 3,026. And in addition, the largest group of indigenous victims consists of 226 Moluccans and 93 Manadonis. Well, what can be said about the relationship between the number of victims and the role of Moluccans representing Dutch colonial interest? In fact, most of the indigenous victims on the Dutch side fell um, among Moluccans. And therefore, it seems as if of all the indigenous groups, they were most closely associated with the Dutch colonial side. It's important to remark here as a side remark that during many ceremonies in the Netherlands that commemorate the victims of the Second World War in the Indies, the commemoration almost always speak of Dutch victims. Those here in the Netherlands who are otherwise almost ignorant about the war only translate this to victims from the Netherlands. And it's therefore better to speak of victims on the Dutch side in order to also commemorate the non-Dutch victims on the Dutch sides, such as some of the Moluccans. The, in, the inventory and the identification of victims has provided an important tool for research into the Moluccan story. The details of the victims include, among others, uh, the date and place of death. By selecting and sorting the data by date and place, all kinds of indication of special events become clear. For example, it shows that on July uh, the 2nd in 1943, a total of 37 people were killed in Ambon City. These included nine members of one family, the Bali Ulu family, and 10 members of the Payapu family. The story behind this is still largely unknown. However, it has been found that the Payapu belonged to the family of the old Mohammed Payapu, who during the Dutch period was head of the village of Luhu on the island of Seram, and who had refused to swear an oath of allegiance to Japan. For every refusal, one member of the family was beheaded before his eyes. And on the 10th refusal, he himself was beheaded. This is just one of the Moluccan stories about the Second World War. And in the same way, the filtering and sorting of the data of the victims during the Bersia period also reveals indication about a special role played by Moluccans. For example, on October 22, 1945, several Moluccans suspected of supporting the Dutch were killed by execution in and around the Simpang Club in Surabaya. According to a later statement by a female witness, a retired Moluccan Knil sergeant was summoned by Indonesian nationalists in the country yard to kneel down so that he could be beheaded. However, he refused to bend down. There directly followed a com commotion on the part of the Indonesian nationalists because there were several young people who wanted to finish the sergeant immediately. And the sergeant shouted, long live Queen Wilhelmina, and he was beheaded. But the story of the Simbang Club also brings up another important aspect the multiple perspectives within a general Moluccan perspective. Moluccans have not only played a role as representatives of Dutch colonial interests, but Moluccans have also played a role on uh, the Indonesian nationalist side. A part of the Moluccan perspective that is virtually unknown to the current Moluccan community in the Netherlands as the offspring of support for Dutch colonial interests. Names of Moluccans who supported Indonesian nationalism 
such as Dr. Johannes Lemena, uh, Johannes Latwarhari, and the Pasukan Laskar Maluku are virtually unknown to the Moluccan community in the Netherlands. As an historian, I am aware of the multiple aspects within uh, a Moluccan perspective, and I therefore also know of Moluccans who have opted for Indonesian independence. Sometimes I imagine, and that's more a kind of romantic image that I have, that Moluccans as political opponents took each other into account and helped each other somewhat. Moluccans help Moluccans. These stories do exist. And that is why I was very shocked as the grandson of an Amunist Knil sergeant, born and raised in the Netherlands, when I continued reading the witness report on the event in the Simpang Club. When the Amunist Knil sergeant did not want to bend over for this uh, beheading, there was a real commotion among the youngsters on the Indonesian side, the Pamuda, who insisted to finish the sergeant. It seemed that these Pamuda were also Moluccans just like the sergeant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm near the end of my presentation. You will find that I have more questions than answers. The general Moluccan story built up from the various Moluccan perspectives is uh, still missing. But recent research promises more information and more opportunities. And I would like to stress that my presentation is um, well, it has to be regarded as a preliminary notes on, on the Moluccan story, which I hopefully will present somewhere next year. And uh, finally, a final statement. As a chain of voices of a forgotten group, Moluccans need their own story of the Second World War and the Indonesian War of Independence. It is also of great importance to realize that a Moluccan perspective consists of more components, more co perspectives, and in order to get the whole story, it's necessary to respectfully include all so the voices of political opponents and stories of self-reflection. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Abibu. And uh, the presentation is really rich with uh, these uh, complex stories in which there are, there are multiple perspectives and experience which really highlights uh, what we might trying to uncover uh, in this uh, today's uh, presentation. I think what really uh, enjoyable from your paper and a more papers earlier was this rich stories. We would we wish that we could hear more stories from uh, Ibu Moore's uh, presentation, but this is the stories that needs to be told and that could be seen in these different uh, ways because there's no one way of, of looking at them. So uh, I will open the uh, floor for question and uh, from the audience. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes for this uh, uh, question and answer. Please raise hand if you would like to ask question, clarification, suggestions to the both presenters. There is one question for Ibu Murdiati from Aulia Menisa. Yes. Um, why women not have been seen or talked much in some research back then? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, but yes. So thank you, Aulia. Uh, uh, from my experience, uh, I found uh, my, my, my sources with interview in many women in life in Surabaya uh, before uh, revolution periods I, and she, uh, before she left uh, from Surabaya to such life we see uh, in my PPT in Ibuha. Ibuha uh, lived in Surabaya. Uh, she was a uh, member of parliament, parliament in uh, DPRD, Parliament uh, 
parliament local locality parliament in Surabaya. But uh, it's very interesting when we we can find many sources women in in Surabaya. But and we can. Uh, but my experience is it's it was very difficult too. But uh, but I have many uh, experience when uh, we have a more uh, more sources when we go to uh, panti uh, panti uh, social such like what's what's the meaning of in uh, English panti social such such uh, uh, the institutions to to deliver um, old people uh, to uh, make elderly a, house yeah yeah sorry. elderly house mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, yeah. Oh, there is a question from Inga to Mr. Ron Habibu. Uh, what is the reason of this uh, difficulties of getting answers? Uh... Thank you. Uh, it's not so difficult to uh, get the answers, but I just started to, um, getting into the uh, literature and uh, archives. So uh, I'm very... Uh, all, um, careful with, with yeah, uh, telling, uh, of uh, sp uh, speaking about uh, answers. So um, that's just to protect myself. I hope this answers your question. I'm sorry, my, my, uh... My in, my connection is getting poorer, so I kind of miss some of the. There's another question from Linawati Siddhartha. Um, oh yeah, uh, I take it that there is some research uh, in Indonesia about Malukans siding with nationalists. Has this work has been shared with Malukans in the Netherlands? Yeah, well, the, yeah, there's uh, one interesting uh, title of the late historian uh, Dr. Richard Lairisa of uh, the Universitas Indonesia, uh, Maluku Dalam Perjuangan Indonesia. Uh, but uh, I have to say that the Indonesian language is, is barely mastered in, in the Netherlands. So uh, there are some works, but the, this will also will be included in, in the further research. Uh, I have a question for for pa Habibu. Uh, is uh, are there any differences among the Malukan community? Those who identified themselves from uh, Saparua or from uh, Ambon or from different parts, and those uh, identity kind of divert, uh, even uh, fragmented more this identity of being the uh, Malukans or Malukan descent. Well. Um... You tackle a very interesting uh, point and that uh, concerns um, we as a Malacan community in the Netherlands, uh, in the diaspora, let's say that, uh, we're isolated from our homeland and therefore to distinguish ourselves because we were just, uh, we were only uh, temporary in the Netherlands, we have to construct a own identity. And in this case, it would be a Moluccan identity. But the Moluccan are so uh, diverse, it's very difficult. And from the early year, years till about uh, the 80s, uh, the Moluccan identity is closely linked to the uh, support for the NMS, the Republic Maluku Salat, an uh, independent uh, Moluccan uh, state. Um, and that's it. Um, as the research of uh, Frida Steiler already uh, uh, figured out, that is um, a social. Uh, the the um, it, it's in fact is um, 
a political uh, insight to, uh, to construct a social identity. So it's, it's rather empty because uh, a Moroccan identity is it's very difficult to construct because if, if we were still in uh, Indonesia or in the Malaccas, we would be uh, really uh, Orang Saparua, Orang Ambon, Orang Kai, and so on. And um, yeah, that's so that's that's uh, a very interesting point, but uh, that's not uh, finished yet. So we are still uh, busy uh, in constructing our own Malaccan uh, identity as uh, as as Malaccas in the uh, diaspora. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a question from oh, there's a comment by Professor Stalen. In the 70s, 80s, there are Moluccans of Indonesian perspective. Mm -hmm. And there is a question from uh, Professor Horton. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, on the, uh, yeah, it is very interesting to examine the stories of Moluccan involvement in various events. And yes, uh, on the Haga conspiracy, is really one of the more uh, controversial uh, things yeah. that many have been written as well. Uh, okay. Um, oh, Pak Bambang Purwanto just sent us uh, his, uh, I assume that's his presentation. Okay, more questions or comments for the two presenters here? Yes, indeed, it's been, it has been a long day for all of us and uh, there will be more tomorrow. Um, so more as exciting. So, bagaimana Pak Sarkawi, Ibu Murdiati? And if not, then I should conclude the, this uh, panel. If there are no more uh, questions or comments, should conclude this session and to with uh, thank uh, to, uh, big thanks to the two presenters, and uh, we should give them, them applaud, big applause for, for their presentation, their really enjoyable presentations. And thank you very much for the, the, the time. The next session uh, should be a concluding part, which I just highlight some of the uh, uh, points that have been raised, um, um, some of the threats that keep appearing. First of all, I think we become uh, richer in our understanding of the Japanese occupation era and era. We highlighted some of the forgotten groups, forgotten uh, voices. And that is uh, uh, really, uh, again, a demonstration how those black and white view uh, uh, of history is far from sufficient. Unfortunately, those are the views that has been picked up by most uh, nationalist uh, 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 historiography, if you like, in all sides of, 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 of the world. Um, and in this uh, nationalistic uh, view, then uh, all these uh, groups, all this experience, all these voices from different groups kind of uh, disappear um, uh, from our view. The, the experience of the miners at the presentation of Ibu Ervisa or the, uh, the view of the Japanese female workers presentation by uh, Professor Horton, also uh, Ibu Ha from a presentation from Ibu Murdiati uh, or uh, Pak Habibu also. Those are the, the experience that kind of lost in the cracks, lost in this uh, grand narrative uh, that has been reproduced in nationalist historiography. Uh, but also there's also some technical issues that has been highlighted also. Some, most of the sources uh, dealing uh, with more official activities and we have to dig deeper. We have to listen as Professor Stalen uh, suggested. We have to uh, try to listen to more stories, um, do more oral histories because uh, um, memory as well. Memory works in selective way. Memory is not some minds that we just go there and pick. Uh, memories being uh, formed uh, by person who's keeping those memories. So again, this is an enterprise that we have to to do. 
both as anthropologists, historians, social workers, to look at the past in a much more uh, rich way. And I think the question now is would be uh, what, what is the way forward? I think what the way forward will, we will see tomorrow. That's one thing. We will listen to more stories. We will hopefully will have a productive dialogue, respectful dialogue, as it was mentioned by Professor uh, Stalen earlier. And then we have to explore more works as uh, uh, Professor Bambang Purwanto has provoked us in our in his presentation in the first one. We have to, to, to challenge ourselves to not to be uh, satisfied with the accepted uh, narratives. We have to look at different ways of the past and hopefully it will be a, a more um, enriching uh, enterprise. With that remarks, I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Janneke Rose, who is also who's from the Stichting of NEJ, I believe. Is uh, Ibu Janneke already here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Yes. I have unmuted myself. Yes. Thank you, and thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, as you have uh, just mentioned, we have reached the end of uh, the first day of the conference, and it was a very full program with uh, extremely stimulating and uh, inspiring presentations and exchanges, and they all underscore once. Uh, again, the complexity of the uh, period of the Japanese occupation and the Indonesian revolution. And to me, indeed, the honor to say some closing remarks. Let me first start by expressing our sincere gratitude for the invaluable support provided by Universitas Erlanga in co-developing uh, the program for the conference and organizing the event. And I think it went very well. Thanks also to the innovative uh, technology also made available by the university. There was universal access and people all over the world could join. Chapeau. The collaboration of the Foundation Dialogue, Netherlands, Japan, Indonesia, a Dutch NGO, uh, with uh, the historic department of Universitas Erlanga goes back to December 2019, when we met with an Indonesian delegation at the KITLV in Leiden. And we discussed ways to start a meaningful dialogue between the people in both our societies. since the momentum seemed to be there to explore whether what separated us before could now connect us. And we took the opportunity to use research as a starting point for meaningful dialogue, contrary to how we started in Japan many years ago. As a result, this conference which is the 23rd for our organization, creates a unique opening to give voice in a different way. Not polarizing, not judgmental, but by reporting and speaking to each other in a respectful manner, where the stories of people's lives can be told and heard. And most importantly also, listening to the first generation persons that were involved in one way or another and making an effort to really understand each other. As has been already said, we all recognized how essential it is to hear the stories of those forgotten groups that have so far mostly been left out in history books. And today's presentations illustrate the enormous complexity of this part of history. 
we learned the importance of oral histories and witnesses accounts by those who were on the ground during and right after the war uh, of the violence committed by all sides and the terrible suffering by innocent people, as is the case in most wars, as we also see today. There was due attention, and I'm very happy for that, to the great suffering of women, an aspect that is often left out in reporting about war and to the complexity of the involvement of the Molokka people. And also literature came up several times in a separate presentation, but also in other presentations. I'm happy with the keynote speakers from the three countries, illustrating the different perspectives and the country narratives, and the interesting Q&A we had. We should also be very grateful to the excellent moderator. I hope he hears this because I see he just left <laughs> for his uh, excellent uh, uh, moderation. Thank you, uh, Pak Diaz. The mission of the uh, Foundation Dialogue NEI is to conduct fruitful and successful dialogue, or rather a trialogue, between stakeholders from the Netherlands, from Japan and Indonesia, about the shared history since World War II in the Asian region. And it seems that so far, this dialogue conference, which is for the first time uh, organized in Indonesia, and as I already mentioned, the 23rd of our organization, uh, organization indeed may be an important stepping stone in building bridges towards recognition and reconciliation between individuals and our three societies. And I'm therefore very much looking forward to the dialogue program of tomorrow. There will be in total five dialogue sessions, of which three physically taking place at Universitas Erlanga, of which one hybrid group and two online dialogue sessions for participants from all over the world. So this is quite a challenge and a, a big challenge to organize. Tomorrow on day two, we will start with a plenary session for all dialogue participants in Indonesia, as well as international. And then we break out in respective dialogue groups have finished the day in plenary session again, where the moderator of uh, uh, Amira Haman will present the synthesis of the reporting from the five different groups. In order to realize this, the preparations included training of dialogue leaders, both from Indonesia and from the Netherlands together. So that was already quite an interesting uh, exercise where the dialogues already started. We are very grateful to the commitment of all the uh, facilitators and the time and the efforts that they are putting in. All in all, we are quite confident that this conference is an important step to more collaboration in the future, and not in the least in revising educational materials in the three countries. I thank you, and I hope to see you in one of our next dialogue conferences. And I see that Pak Diaz is back. So I once uh, again want to thank you very much for your excellent uh, moderation. Very good. Without that, we would have not had such a successful day today. Thank you. This is Bumur now, starting to close the session.
Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, pa, uh, Diaz, and thank you for uh, key, uh, international speakers, participants today, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you are, uh, we hopefully that uh, we, has, we have stay healthy. And if you don't mind, uh, please off cam, uh, maybe we can um, take a picture together. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Once more again. Thank you so much. So uh, please uh, yeah, come tomorrow morning to dialogue program. Thank you everybody and enjoy your day to today. Thank you so much.